What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What If I Became the Mastermind of Akatsuki in Naruto, Part 2. If you enjoy this type of content, please gently pulverize the like button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Do you know how to bring about change? How to achieve peace in the land of rain? Yahiko's own words hung heavy in the air, surprising even him. Just a month ago, Yahiko might have only half listened to Bayakuya's musings. After all, the seemingly flippant Bayakuya often tossed out thought-provoking ideas along with his joke. But the past month had been a harsh teacher. The Akatsuki had faced a relentless series of challenges, dwindling weapon stockpiles, a critical lack of medical supplies. The exhaustion etched on his companions' faces mirrored the growing doubt gnawing at Yahiko himself. He wasn't the only one questioning the Akatsuki's ideals anymore. It was why he'd recently proposed stepping down as leader to Nagato. Bayakuya, sensing Yahiko's genuine turmoil, offered a gentle head shake. Peace for Amige Cure, in the short term, is beyond the Akatsuki's reach. Even with Lord Hanzo's strength, achieving that would take years, if not longer. But there is something we can do, normalize the organization. Yahiko's brow furrowed. Bayakuya's words were cryptic, their meaning lost on him. Orphaned at a young age, his education had been limited to Jiraiya Sensei's three years of tutelage. Beyond that, the world was of vast unknown. His guiding principles were a patchwork of Jiraiya's teachings, his own experiences, and the ever-present ache for peace. Bayakuya felt a hit of helplessness as he saw the eager hope surfacing in Yahiko's eyes. This Yahiko, a year into their comradeship, was far more mature than his counterpart from the original timeline. Yet, a certain naivety lingered, a stark contrast to the steely resolve Conan and Nagato would develop in the coming decade. Back then, Conan ruled the land of rain with an iron fist, a semblance of order amidst the lingering poverty, a far cry from the war-torn existence they currently endured. Though life remained impoverished, at least they weren't plagued by the ravages of war. Bayakuya's words cut through the air, clear and concise. Think of it like this. We need to run Akatsuki like a proper shinobi village. By establishing a ranking system and a fair system of rewards and punishments, we can offer our members something more tangible to fight for than just empty dreams. Yahiko furrowed his brow in concentration. So, these from Jutsu scrolls you captured from Kuzagakure, you're suggesting we use them to build this system, not distribute them directly? Bayakuya met his gaze earnestly. Yahiko, if you want Akatsuki to remain a tiny band of just a few dozen, then by all means, hand them out freely. But listen closely. The reason I suggested using these scrolls for a reward system is because, I, more than anyone, want Akatsuki to become a truly powerful organization. Sharing every Jutsu scroll with every member might work for a small, core group, three, maybe five people at most. But once a group grows too large, that kind of free access becomes a detriment. It hinders healthy competition and undermines the organization's internal growth. Bayakuya elaborated. The weight of Bayakuya's words settled heavily on Yahiko. The idea of internal collapse, Akatsuki falling apart not from external enemies but from its own flaws, sent a shiver down his spine. He yearned for a world of open sharing, but Bayakuya's logic was undeniable. All right, so how do we set up this reward system? Yahiko finally asked, his voice hesitant. And wouldn't implementing such a drastic change make us look just like another run-of-the-mill ninja village? Bayakuya sighed, a hint of exasperation coloring his expression. Yahiko, you're the leader. Whether it's based on the number of completed missions or their difficulty, you can create a point system that works for us. Look, we don't have to be exactly like the established villages. We can learn from their mistakes, keep their strengths, and build something entirely new. A chuckle escaped Yahiko's lip. Bayakuya was right. Why hadn't he considered this before? 
Here he was, yearning for a world of trust and open hearts, while the solution might have been right under his nose all along. A genuine smile spread across Yahiko's face as he looked up at Bayakuya. Bayakuya, you're a wealth of knowledge. Why didn't you share these ideas earlier? We could have avoided so many arguments and had productive discussions instead. Bayakuya snorted, a dismissive puff of air escaping his nose. Don't be naive, Yahiko. A world of perfect trust? That's a fantasy. Here's the reality. No matter how bright the light, there will always be shadows that darkness clings to. With that final, cryptic statement, Bayakuya placed the storage scroll containing the Jutsu scrolls on the table and turned to leave the office, leaving Yahiko with a thoughtful frown. Yahiko watched Bayakuya leave, his departing words echoing in the silent office. I believe you do think such a world can exist. Otherwise, you wouldn't have shared your ideas with me. Meanwhile, Bayakuya emerged from the office to find Nagato, Conan, and Karen waiting nearby. His gaze swept over them before settling on Karen. Karen, for now, follow Yahiko's arrangements and stay at the base. Given your current skill level, going on missions would be unwise. With that, Bayakuya vanished into the labyrinthine halls of the base. Karen frowned, bewildered. What's wrong with Lord Bayakuya? Wasn't he just arguing with Yahiko-sama? Why is he asking me to follow Yahiko-sama's orders now? Conan, her face unreadable, finally spoke after spending weeks studying Bayakuya's interactions with Yahiko. They weren't arguing, she said simply. Nagato offered a curt nod in agreement. The trio then returned to the office. Yahiko, his demeanor noticeably lighter than just moments ago, retrieved a blank notebook and addressed them all with newfound seriousness. Following discussions with Bayakuya, we're planning some changes within the organization. We'll establish a clear system of rewards and punishments based on the Jutsu scrolls we acquired. If anyone has suggestions, please don't hesitate to speak up. Karen's brow furrowed, a vein pulsing on her temple. Karen realized Nagato and Conan were right. Yahiko and Bayakuya hadn't been arguing at all. They'd been engaged in a thoughtful exchange about the Akatsuki's future. This collaborative atmosphere was a far cry from what she'd envisioned, yet a strange sense of satisfaction bloomed within her. As Yahiko, Nagato, Conan, and Karen delved into the creation of the reward and punishment system, a paper clone of Bayakuya observed them from the shadows. The scene unfolding before him brought a satisfied crease to his brow. It wasn't just Yahiko's receptiveness to his ideas that pleased him. There were deeper reasons at play. Bayakuya's recent mission, which yielded a wealth of resources and spurred him to propose reforms for the Akatsuki, had fundamentally altered his standing within the organization. Members who initially disagreed with Yahiko's idealistic vision now found themselves aligned with his goals, albeit disillusioned by the harsh realities they faced and the Akatsuki's current state of disarray. Bayakuya's head snapped up at the sound of Karen's voice filtering through the door. Lord Bayakuya, may I ask what I can do for you? He sighed, already picturing her helpless expression. Rising from his chair, he opened the door to find his suspicions confirmed. Bayakuya's brow furrowed in confusion. Didn't I tell you to follow Yahiko's arrangements? Why come to me? Yahiko-sama instructed me to follow you. He said the members you recruited should take care of your needs. Bayakuya rolled his eyes, a silent concession to Yahiko's well-meaning meddling. He ushered Karen inside and gestured towards a kettle in the corner. There's hot water over there. Feel free to pour yourself a cup if you'd like. Karen nodded, a flicker of relief crossing her features as she busied herself with the kettle. Bayakuya watched her, his gaze lingering on her youthful face etched with worry. He understood her trepidation. Witnessing the destruction of her homeland and the loss of her family had left her deeply afraid of being cast out again, of becoming a nomad in the unforgiving ninja world. It was this very fear that had led her to endure the harsh constraints of Kusagakure, clinging to any semblance of stability. Bayakuya steepled his fingers, his mind turning over the question of Karen's placement within the Akatsuki. As an Uzumaki, she possessed immense potential, impressive sealing techniques, powerful ninjutsu, and a natural aptitude for sensory perception. With proper training, she could easily become a high-level ninja, perhaps even rivaling the likes of Karen, an elite with exceptional healing ability. However, Karen had benefited from Orochimaru's tutelage, a training regimen far superior to what Bayakuya could currently offer. 
the logical solution, from a purely utilitarian standpoint, would be to confine Karen and drain her blood for healing purpose. But unlike Karen, he had no need for her healing abilities. Yet, the Akatsuki's glaring lack of medical personnel made the idea of nurturing her medical ninjutsu a tempting prospect. Bayakuya raised his cup to his lips, took a sip of water, and then set it down with a thoughtful sigh. There's not much I can arrange for you right now, but if you're truly at loose ends, you could consider becoming a medical neen. Karen's eyes widened in surprise. Become a medical neen? She echoed, a tremor of fear creeping into her voice. Instinctively, she pulled up her sleeves, revealing arms crisscrossed with old wounds. Do you want to draw blood? I can only offer 30 milliliters a day, at most. Any more than that, and it'll weaken me. Bayakuya blinked, a heavy silence settling in the room as he realized Karen had completely misinterpreted him. Nope, my intention is for you to become a true medical neen, one who relies on skill rather than just their special lineage. Even if you drained yourself entirely, how much good would it truly do? What this organization desperately needs is more medical personnel. With proper training, you could easily become our top medical neen. Relief washed over Karen's features. It didn't matter what specific task Bayakuya assigned her. All she craved was a purpose, a way to prove her worth, even if it meant offering her own blood. After experiencing such tremendous loss, being given a chance to contribute filled her with an almost paralyzing fear of failure. However, a flicker of doubt flickered across her brow. Throughout her life, countless ninjas had reacted differently upon learning about her blood's healing properties. Yet, Bayakuya seemed utterly unconcerned with it, almost dismissive. It felt strange. Did he not fear injury? Or was there another motive at play? Bayakuya couldn't help but notice the shift in Karen's expression. He'd initially believed her to be far more well-adjusted than Karen, but it seemed remnants of past trauma still lingered. Thankfully, they appeared salvageable, a silver lining in this unexpected situation. Reaching into his backpack, Bayakuya retrieved a scroll and offered it to Karen. This contains basic medical ninjutsu technique. While I can offer you a personal letter of recommendation, mastering the fundamentals will be your responsibility. Study diligently, and I have faith you can become a valuable asset to the organization, even inspiring others to pursue medical ninjutsu. A spark of determination ignited in Karen's eyes as she accepted the scroll. Thank you, she said sincerely, her voice filled with gratitude. With newfound purpose driving her, she bowed respectfully and exited the room. Alone again, Bayakuya closed the door behind her with a sigh. His gaze drifted towards Yahiko's office, a thoughtful glint in his eyes. Perhaps, he mused, this unexpected turn of events might just prove beneficial for the Akatsuki's future. Bayakuya kept his reasons for giving Karen the medical ninjutsu scroll hidden from Yahiko. That's why he made a show of having Karen stay with him. However, he did need to build his own team, and Karen seemed like a perfect candidate. Despite having a good relationship with Conan and Nagato, Bayakuya lacked the shared history they had with each other. He hadn't wandered with them or learned from Jiraiya, making it difficult to truly integrate into their existing dynamic. Karen, on the other hand, was a blank slate. Bayakuya had saved her, and she now looked to him for guidance. Furthermore, if Karen could blossom into a skilled medical neen through self-study, she could establish a medical department within Akatsuki. This would not only benefit the organization but also create a positive internal cycle. With a satisfied sigh, Bayakuya closed his eyes, longing for a moment of rest. The following days unfolded with a newfound sense of ease for Bayakuya. With no external missions on his plate, he reveled in a more relaxed routine. His days were dedicated to honing his ninjutsu and taijutsu skills in the training ground. Evenings brought a welcome respite, a bath, a warm cup of milk, and a blissful eight hours of sleep ensured he was well rested for the next day's endeavors. Logically, Bayakuya's system meant he didn't necessarily need to dedicate so much time to physical training. He could simply wait for the feedback from Akatsuki members. However, the execution and timing of a jutsu could drastically alter its outcome. It was akin to a past-life ninja game he'd played, Characters with identical abilities could achieve vastly different results based on the player's skill. This was the elegance of strategic manipulation, a far cry from brute force achieved through maxed-out stats. Of course, maintaining appearances was paramount. 
it wouldn't be believable for him to possess such immense strength without putting in the regular practice, even if he could use exceptional talent as an excuse. After all, his skills had skyrocketed from a mid-level Chunin to an elite Jonin in just over a month. Wiping sweat from his brow after an intense training session, Bayakuya gratefully accepted the cup of warm salt water Karen offered. He took a deep swig, then turned towards Nagato, who was also diligently training. Nagato-senpai care for some? Nagato hesitated briefly before accepting the cup and draining it in one go. As they both used towels to mop up sweat, Bayakuya inquired, haven't seen Conan Senpai around lately. Where'd she disappear to? Nagato cast him a sidelong glance, locked herself in the room, churning out exploding tags. She's convinced it'll solve our financial woes, and even Yahiko can't seem to budge her. Bayakuya's expression contorted into a grimace at the image of Conan hunched over in a dimly lit room, tirelessly creating exploding tags. While he himself had suggested this method of generating revenue, surely there was a limit. Had she forgotten the basic principles of economics? Flooding the market with exploding tags would inevitably drive down the price, negating the entire purpose of the exercise. Still, considering the ongoing Third Shinobi War, Conan's future as an arms dealer held some promise. At least in the short term, they wouldn't have to worry about a surplus of unsold tags. But wouldn't that make them a rather paradoxical organization, peace-loving arms dealers? A curious thought flickered across Bayakuya's mind. Perhaps there wasn't an inherent contradiction between those two ideals. After all, wouldn't a world with readily available, affordable deterrents like exploding tags discourage reckless aggression? Perhaps a well-armed populace could act as a force for peace, a concept he could explore further in the future. Before the atmosphere turned awkward, Bayakuya took the initiative to speak up. Nagato-senpai, don't worry. I'll go and persuade Conan Senpai later to reduce the number of explosive tags she sells appropriately and raise the prices. Then, you won't have to work so hard. T thanks. Nagato found Bayakuya's words somewhat odd, but still managed to force out a thank you. After all, without Bayakuya's strategy, the organization's financial crisis would have been impossible to resolve, and their comrades wouldn't have regained their smiles. With logistical support in place, the Akatsuki members could now carry out their missions with peace of mind. If you must thank someone, Nagato-senpai, why not spar with me? I'd like to see Nagato-senpai's strength and assess the gap between us. Bayakuya suggested a sparring match after Nagato's thing. The evaluation on the system panel was locked, and Bayakuya was eager to test his true strength. Nagato hesitated for a moment upon hearing Bayakuya's request, but ultimately nodded in agreement. He too was curious about Bayakuya's actual strength. Previously, Bayakuya had demonstrated strength on par with a Chunin, but after their trip to the village hidden in the grass, Bayakuya alone had diverted the attention of the grass shinobi, showcasing combat capabilities far beyond those of a Chunin. Even with his Rinnegan activated, achieving such feats was extremely difficult. After nodding in agreement, Bayakuya and Nagato moved to the center of the open space, formed the seal of opposition, and then stepped back from each other, leaving enough distance between them. Karen, the sole spectator at the scene, stood at the edge of the field, eagerly anticipating the outcome of this spar. Karen's gaze darted between Bayakuya and Nagato, both formidable opponents in her eyes. Bayakuya's swift takedown of a rock ninja with explosive tags lingered in her memory, a testament to his prowess. Nagato, on the other hand, bore the legendary Rinnegan, the sage of the Six Paths' own eyes. The official start of the match shattered the tense silence. Nagato slammed his palms together, a guttural yell escaping his lips. Wind release, gale palm, chakra surged, swirling into a miniature tornado in his grasp. With a forceful thrust of his palms, the fierce wind roared towards Bayakuya's position. Caught off guard by the sudden onslaught, Bayakuya was flung through the air. But his paper release technique served him well allowing him to regain control and achieve aerial dominance. Paper shurikens materialized in his hands with practiced ease, flying like deadly darts towards Nagato. Nagato's eyes widened momentarily as he reacted with a swift leap, narrowly evading the shurikens that landed harmlessly at his feet. He knew Bayakuya had mastered Conan's paper release, but witnessing his proficiency was a different story entirely. The display surpassed even Conan's own skill. The fight intensified, 
Nagato launched a barrage of basic ninjutsu techniques, aiming to force Bayakuya back to the ground and nullify his aerial advantage. Bayakuya, however, displayed his agility, weaving through the attacks before landing gracefully atop a towering tree. Despite not utilizing his Rinnegan, Nagato's strength remained undeniable. His effortless mastery of all five basic elemental releases rendered him a formidable opponent capable of countering most conventional ninjas. In a way, he resembled a younger third Hokage. But Bayakuya wasn't phased. Even the basic elements held no threat for him now. With a flick of his wrist, he unleashed a torrent of explosive tags, long accumulated for this very moment. The tags rained down, creating a series of thunderous explosions upon contact with the ground. Nagato, forced to retreat on the ground, furrowed his brow. The spar Bayakuya mentioned and the one he envisioned diverged significantly. Yet, he could only truly evaluate Bayakuya's full strength through such a battle. The ground trembled around Karen as she listened to the relentless symphony of explosions. She envisioned herself as a lone blade of grass buffeted by a raging storm. Originally a mere spectator, the sheer intensity of the battle now forced her to retreat, putting a safe distance between herself and the clashing titans. The commotion at the training grounds did not go unnoticed by the active Akatsuki members stationed around the base. Exchanging hurried glances, they converged towards the office, intent on reporting the matter to Yahiko. Yahiko listened intently as his subordinates relayed their report. His gaze drifted towards the training grounds, the continuous explosions were a dead giveaway. Bayakuya, without a doubt, had stirred things up again. Conan, unlike Bayakuya, employed explosive tags with a calculated approach. He recalled her recent refusal when he requested some for practice, citing them as products meant for external sales only. With a sigh, Yahiko shifted his attention to the plan book on his desk. It's not an enemy attack, just Bayakuya practicing his jutsu. Head over there, assess the situation, and tell him to see me afterward. Understood. The Akatsuki ninja acknowledged. Curiosity peaked about the unfolding events at the training ground. Several Akatsuki members soon arrived near the area, only to be intercepted by Karen. Recognizing the recent addition to the organization, they shot her puzzled looks. Hold on. Bayakuya-sama and Nagato-senpai are sparring inside. Getting too close could be dangerous. Karen instructed, her expression serious. Her warning was cut short by a sudden eruption of blinding light nearby. Before the ninjas could adjust to the intense glare, deafening explosions ripped through the air, sending tremors through the ground. The Akatsuki members, now shell-shocked, exchanged stunned glances. They had joined the Akatsuki under the belief it was a peace-driven organization, completely unaware of the immense power harbored within its rank. This revelation shattered their expectations. Across the training grounds, Nagato, panting heavily, glared at Bayakuya in the distance. He'd been forced to unleash Shinra Tensei to repel the barrage of explosive tags. Bayakuya, too, displayed signs of chakra exhaustion. As the spar escalated, both fighters instinctively resorted to their most potent technique. The aftermath painted a picture of mutual damage. Picking up a towel from the ground, Bayakuya dabbed the blood trickling down his forehead, gasping for breath. Nagato-senpai, your strength surpasses my expectations. Is this the power of the Rinnegan? Nagato, a tremor of fear still lingering in his voice, recollected the onslaught of explosive tags. Why, Bayakuya? Why force me to use the Rinnegan? I don't desire to wield these eyes. I haven't mastered their abilities yet. Nagato-senpai, confronting this power is inevitable. It's far better to adapt to the Rinnegan's potential now, to unlock its full strength, than to wait for a desperate moment or a tragedy. Bayakuya approached Nagato, a faint smile playing on his lips. Nagato remained silent, his hair obscuring the Rinnegan from view. This wasn't the first time Bayakuya had spoken of such an approach. Just then, the commotion at the training grounds subsided. This lull drew the attention of Akatsuki members and Karen, who rushed towards the scene. Shock rippled through the Akatsuki members as they entered the training ground. Their eyes widened at the scene before them. The once smooth expanse of the training area was now a wasteland. Craters of various sizes dotted the ground like grotesque wounds. Uprooted trees lay scattered like fallen soldiers, and broken branches littered the area. But the most prominent feature was the large, unmistakable oval-shaped pit dominating the center. 
The sheer scale of the destruction spoke volumes. This wasn't your average jutsu. It was the work of an incredibly powerful technique. Even a combined effort from several Earth release users wouldn't have caused such widespread devastation. Additionally, the nature of the damage hinted at a jutsu unlike any they'd seen before. Karen, though slightly better at concealing her surprise compared to her companions, couldn't entirely mask the astonishment on her face. Shaking off the initial shock, Karen approached Bayakuya and pointed towards the Akatsuki members behind her. Lord Bayakuya, these seniors seem to have something they wish to discuss with you. Bayakuya acknowledged her with a curt nod and walked towards the group. He had anticipated this moment. Using explosive tags to bombard Nagato wasn't exactly a stealthy tactic especially considering the confined space of the Akatsuki base. However, completing the intense sparring session with Nagato was vital, even if it meant revealing some of his power. There were two key reasons behind his actions. Firstly, he wanted to instill a sense of urgency in Nagato. The near-death experience would hopefully push him to delve deeper into the secrets of the Rinnegan and develop techniques like the Six Paths of Pain. This, in turn, would accelerate Bayakuya's own reward system. Among the Akatsuki's leadership, Conan's combat prowess heavily relied on the number of explosive tags at her disposal. Significant growth in her strength seemed unlikely in the short term. Nagato, on the other hand, possessed immense potential, like an unopened treasure chest waiting to be explored. Yahiko, the leader, served his purpose well enough, but Bayakuya held little hope for exceptional growth from him. Secondly, Bayakuya aimed to leverage this display of power to elevate his standing within the organization. While he held a squad leader position, his status paled in comparison to the founders, particularly Yahiko. Even securing vital supplies for the Akatsuki did little to significantly improve his standing. The missions he undertook alongside Conan and Nagato inevitably raised suspicions amongst the others. Bayakuya approached the Akatsuki members, a confident smile gracing his lips. We were just having a sparring session, Nagato-senpai and I, he announced. Anything wrong? Perhaps you'd like to join in the training? The Akatsuki ninjas exchanged uneasy glances, their eyes darting towards the vacant training field nearby before quickly snapping back to Bayakuya. Their slender frames wouldn't last a second in a battle of this scale. However, Bayakuya's casual admission sent a tremor through them. The enormous pit was a consequence of his sparring with Nagato? This implied Bayakuya possessed power on par with Nagato, potentially even rivaling a jonin from the five great shinobi villages. Lord Bayakuya, we're aware you were at the training ground. Yahiko-sama requested your presence at the office. As for the sparring, well, we have duties to attend to and wouldn't want to disrupt your training. With that, the Akatsuki members mumbled hurried excuses and scurried away. The respectful address... Lord Bayakuya, brought a surge of satisfaction to Bayakuya. This recognition was a step in the right direction. His standing within the Akatsuki was undeniably on the rise. But what did Yahiko want? Was there a critical mission on the horizon? No point in dwelling on it, he'd get his answer straight from Yahiko himself. However, before heading to the office, Bayakuya had one more task at hand. He returned to Nagato, a light smile playing on his lips. Nagato-senpai, have you made any progress in unlocking the Rinnegan's potential? Remember, if you can't even best me, how can you hope to protect the others? Bayakuya's intention was clear. To use combat as a motivator, to spark a desire for greater strength within Nagato. Nagato, however, furrowed his brow in confusion. Bayakuya, why this constant pursuit of power? Isn't our current life satisfactory? Do we truly need to become stronger? Bayakuya was momentarily struck silent. Before the Akatsuki faced near annihilation, Nagato's approach to mastering the Rinnegan was undeniably relaxed. But continuing down this path could prove disastrous for the organization's future. After a few seconds of contemplation, Bayakuya's expression hardened. Nagato-senpai, have you forgotten who we are? We were all orphaned once. You, better than anyone, understand the consequences of powerlessness. Nagato seemed lost struggling to decipher Bayakuya's underlying message. Yahiko-senpai needs me, Bayakuya continued, not wanting to waste any more time. I'll take my leave for now. He gave Nagato a long, hard look before turning to depart from the training ground. As he did, Bayakuya deliberately flexed his arm, revealing a glimpse of blood staining the sleeve. 
Karen's sharp eyes caught Bayakuya's injured arm. She hurried over, her voice laced with worry. Lord Bayakuya, that looks painful. Would you like me to use my healing blood on it? As she spoke, Karen retrieved a small vial filled with her crimson liquid, a potent substitute for medical ninjutsu. Bayakuya, however, shook his head. Don't worry, Karen. It's just a Shinra Tensei injury. The repulsion is forceful, but it's nothing serious. It will heal in a few hours, while Bayakuya's words held truth. He could handle the wound, or there was more to his refusal. He, too, possessed the Uzumaki clan's remarkable regenerative abilities. Unlike ordinary ninja, even severe punctures mended within days. But most importantly, Bayakuya saw an opportunity. He wanted to showcase this extraordinary power. To his satisfaction, both Karen and Nagato had noticed his injury. They watched, a hint of awe in their eyes, as the wound visibly knitted itself back together, returning to its flawless state. Karen, understanding his unspoken message, made no further attempts to intervene. She remained with Nagato, her gaze lingering on Bayakuya's retreating figure. Memories flickered in their minds. Bayakuya's daring attack on Kuzagakir to rescue Karen, his frustration with Nagato's reluctance to train with the Rinnegan, and his resolute departure after their discussion. Now these fragments clicked into place. Suddenly, the pieces fit. If Bayakuya, like them, was an orphan of the Uzumaki clan, everything made sense. His warmth towards them, his eagerness to hone their skills, it all stemmed from a shared lineage. He was determined to prevent another tragedy like Yuzushiogakure's destruction. A thoughtful silence descended upon them. Finally, Karen spoke. Nagato-senpai, Lord Bayakuya's wound healed so quickly. That's the Uzumaki clan's trait, isn't it? Do you know of any other clans with similar abilities? Nagato shook his head, then paused, a flicker of recollection crossing his features. But wait, Bayakuya's sensory perception rivals mine, yet he lacks our red hair. Maybe he just didn't inherit that specific trait. Karen, her brow furrowed, ventured. Nagato offered a curt nod, seemingly accepting her explanation. Still, a question lingered. Why would Bayakuya conceal his Uzumaki heritage? Was there some unknown reason behind it? Perhaps Bayakuya himself wasn't aware of his Uzumaki lineage. Maybe his inexplicable connection to them stemmed from an unconscious kinship, a primal pull towards his shared bloodline. Nagato and Karen were stormed with the question, could Bayakuya himself be oblivious to the Uzumaki blood that pulsed beneath his skin? It seemed the only explanation for the shrouded lineage that gnawed at them. I'm going to tell Lord Bayakuya, Karen declared, a fierce determination replacing the tremor in her voice. He has the right to know. He might be a descendant of the Uzumaki clan, kin to us. Before Karen could dash after Bayakuya, Nagato's voice snagged her attention. Karen, do you truly believe Bayakuya will simply accept this revelation? He's already on edge. We need to choose a more opportune moment, a time when he's receptive. But when will that moment arrive? Karen pressed, frustration evident in the furrow of her brow. Nagato hesitated, unable to offer a definitive answer. Let's wait for now. Nagato sighed, recalling his memories. His arrival in Rain Country as a child and his mother's hushed stories about the land of Uzumaki. A powerful ninja clan, they had established a nation, only to be brought to its knees by a coalition of opposing forces. He hadn't even laid eyes on the ruins of the land of whirlpools in the aftermath. Yet, Bayakuya's words struck a chord. Akatsuki desperately needed strength, a shield against the ever-present threat from the outside world. The Uzumakis were a stark reminder of that very need, a mighty clan brought low by a lack of sufficient power. If their true identities were exposed, could Akatsuki suffer a similar downfall? Perhaps a new thought bloomed in Nagato's mind. It was time to truly delve into the power of the Rinnegan. He needed to unlock its full potential, not just for himself but also for the sake of Akatsuki's survival. When Nagato and Karen were contemplating, Bayakuya had already arrived at the Akatsuki office. Pushing open the door, Yahiko moved his eyes away from the official documents and half-jokingly said, Bayakuya, you are finally here. Almost the entire base knows about the noise you made at the training ground just now. Bayakuya was not surprised that Yahiko knew about his training at the ground. If he couldn't manage even this level of control, it would be better for Nagato to take Yahiko's position in the Akatsuki organization. 
Bayakuya was more curious about what Yahiko wanted to discuss, so he asked, Yahiko, did you ask me to come here for this? If you're worried about the base's safety, Nagato and I can find another place to spar next time. You are sparring with Nagato? Yahiko's interest was piqued. How did it go? When Nagato-senpai doesn't use the Rinnegan, I have the upper hand. When he uses the Rinnegan, we are currently evenly matched. We are of the same strength? Yahiko was slightly stunned and then sighed. Bayakuya, your strength has shown a remarkable increase recently. Were you deliberately concealing your true abilities before? Bayakuya conceded with a curt nod. There's truth to that. However, I must confess to being rather disappointed with Nagato-senpai's current level of strength. Seizing the opportunity presented by Yahiko's concern, Bayakuya hoped to use it to advance his agenda. If he could convince Yahiko, influencing Nagato would be a smoother transition. Why is that? Yahiko tapped his fingers on the table. Yahiko knew that Bayakuya had learned Conan's paper escape and often instigated Nagato to use the Rinnegan. He trusted Bayakuya but sometimes wondered if Bayakuya's sense of crisis was too serious. More than a year had passed since the organization's establishment, and apart from financial issues, the organization had never faced a military crisis. In the end, the Akatsuki organization was just a small group active in some parts of the rain country. It didn't even have the qualifications to establish a small ninja village independently and wasn't worth the attention of the major players in the ninja world. The Rinnegan. If Nagato-senpai didn't have the Rinnegan, I wouldn't expect much from him. But since he has the Rinnegan, he must possess the strength to match its owner. Otherwise, he will become a target. Nagato-senpai is powerful now but cannot resist when he meets a real strong man. A man is innocent but guilty of possessing a treasure. This is what Bayakuya wanted to express to Yahiko. Yahiko fell into contemplation, his mind replaying the scene from years ago, before they met Jiraiya as their teacher. A relentless downpour lashed the ground as he, Conan, and Nagato, desperate for guidance, stood before the legendary Sanin. A cold glint flickered in Orochimaru's eyes as he advocated for their elimination. Thankfully, Jiraiya, their eventual savior, stepped forward and offered them a chance to learn under his wing. A shiver ran down Yahiko's spine when he recalled that memory. The chilling thought of Orochimaru discovering Nagato's Rinnegan back then sent a jolt of fear through him. Their lives could have taken a nightmarish turn, perhaps ending abruptly right there. While they had undoubtedly honed their skills to Jonin level, a nagging insecurity stormed at him. The immense power wielded by the Sanin still felt like an insurmountable obstacle. Perhaps Bayakuya wasn't entirely off-base, Maybe the comfort and relative peace of recent years had lulled them into a false sense of security, eroding their edge. Bayakuya, I apologize for taking up your time. I'll speak to Nagato, emphasizing the importance of controlled development to avoid harming himself while harnessing the Rinnegan's power. Taking a deep breath to steady himself, Yahiko spoke with a hint of regret. Bayakuya offered a curt nod, a flicker of satisfaction crossing his features. Yahiko's agreement paved the way for him to directly influence Nagato. However, before you leave, there's another matter that requires your expertise? Yahiko interjected, a new thought striking him. What can I do for you? Bayakuya inquired, his voice laced with a hint of forced courtesy. I've been working on a reward and punishment system for the organization, drawing inspiration from Kanahigakure's model. Yahiko explained, retrieving a document from his drawer. I'd appreciate your insights on it. Bayakuya took the document, his expression unreadable as he skimmed through it. It seems alright at first glance. No specific feedback? I've revised this thing countless times, but some sections still feel unbalanced. I can't quite pinpoint the problem. I have no doubt, Bayakuya, that you could craft an impeccable system with your expertise. Yahiko's disappointment was clear. Bayakuya felt a bead of sweat roll down his temple. The pressure was unexpectedly intense, far more nerve-wracking than facing the leader of Kuzagakur itself. Back in his previous life, he was a diligent worker, not a strategic mastermind. While he possessed theoretical knowledge of reward and punishment structures, he lacked the practical experience to translate it into a real-world system for Akatsuki. After Yahiko confessed his anxieties about the reward and punishment system, a lengthy silence descended upon the Akatsuki office. Bayakuya, his brow furrowed in concentration, 
finally lifted his head. His expression was solemn as he spoke. Yahiko, on the surface, your plan appears sound. A well-defined system of rewards and punishments is essential for any organization, and borrowing from established models like Kanahigakur's is a logical starting point. A glint of hope ignited in Yahiko's eyes. Bayakuya's acknowledgement of the plan's merits was a welcome change from the non-committal response he'd initially received. Bayakuya continued, his tone turning more pointed. However, the true test lies in implementation. No matter how meticulously crafted, theoretical frameworks can often reveal unforeseen shortcomings when put into practice. Here's what I propose. Why not introduce this as a trial version for a set period? Yahiko leaned forward, his interest piqued by Bayakuya's suggestion. A trial version? You mean? Exactly. Run the system for a few weeks, observe its effectiveness, and identify any areas requiring adjustment. Remember, Yahiko, true problem-solving hinges on seeking truth from fact. Only through real-world application can we identify and rectify flaws in the system. Bayakuya confirmed with a nod. Yahiko repeated the last part of Bayakuya's sentence under his breath, a genuine smile spreading across his face. Seeking truth from facts. He murmured, the weight of Bayakuya's words settling in. Bayakuya, you've made a valuable point. Just for this insight alone, your presence here today has been invaluable. Relief and a newfound sense of direction washed over Yahiko. He now had a clear path forward, a trial period to test the system and gather data before permanent implementation. I understand. I'll follow your instructions, Bayakuya. I'll announce this reward and punishment system at the meeting tomorrow. Yahiko replied, his voice firm. Bayakuya offered a curt nod, acknowledging Yahiko's agreement. Then, he added, as if a forgotten detail surfaced in his mind. Oh, by the way, I won't be attending tomorrow's organizational meeting. I'm eager to see how you handle it. Yahiko's brow furrowed in confusion. Why? After all, you're the one who proposed the reward and punishment system. Bayakuya's reluctance to attend the meeting baffled Yahiko. In his perspective, it was a golden opportunity for Bayakuya to assert his leadership and potentially soften his harsh reputation among the organization's members. Bayakuya began, his gaze steady. Yahiko, every organization needs someone to handle the unpleasant task. If you're not interested, it falls to me. On the other hand, you are far better suited to promoting mutual understanding at the meeting. Arguing with you there would be unproductive at that time. So my absence would be better for us not going into arguing at the meeting. Yahiko paused, momentarily speechless. A wry smile tugged at his lips as he conceded defeat in his attempt to persuade Bayakuya. Despite being comrades within the same organization, capable of engaging in serious discussions for the betterment of Akatsuki, their fundamental beliefs diverged sharply when it came to conflict resolution. Yahiko championed peace through mutual understanding, viewing force as a last resort. He tirelessly pursued peaceful solutions whenever possible. Bayakuya, however, appeared to hold a stronger conviction in the power of force, seemingly dismissing the notion of mutual understanding. When faced with adversaries, Yahiko would seek to subdue them, while Bayakuya's approach was swift and final elimination. This fundamental difference was the greatest point of contention between them. The thought sparked a memory within Yahiko, one that had simmered in his mind for quite some time. After Nagato's refusal of the leadership position and Bayakuya's subsequent display of the strength befitting a leader, Yahiko had entertained the notion of entrusting the leadership to Bayakuya. However, Bayakuya's current stance caused him to hesitate once again. There was no guarantee that Bayakuya, as leader, wouldn't steer Akatsuki down a perilous path. Bayakuya undoubtedly noticed Yahiko's internal struggle reflected in his conflicted expression. He opted for silence, simply offering a brief farewell before departing from the office. Bayakuya possessed a keen intuition, and he likely had a good grasp of Yahiko's contemplation regarding the leadership position. Bayakuya understood the urgency of addressing the leadership issue. While Yahiko's temperament and leadership style made him the ideal candidate for Akatsuki's current state, Bayakuya craved a different role. He yearned for a position of influence, a powerful advisor who could steer the organization's direction without getting bogged down in the minutiae of daily management. Yahiko's benevolent leadership had undeniably been the glue that held the Akatsuki together. It was this very cohesion that Bayakuya, with his focus on raw power, might inadvertently dismantle if thrust into the leadership role. 
as Bayakuya strode through the Akatsuki base, a subtle shift in the atmosphere was palpable. The ninjas he passed no longer treated him with mere respect, there was a newfound reverence in their gazes. His display of strength against Nagato had undeniably elevated his standing within the organization. It was a curious side effect, wherever he went, he commanded attention. This newfound respect, however, wasn't his primary motivation. Before making his way to the training grounds to hone his own formidable skills, Bayakuya remembered his promise to Nagato. He remembered the blue-haired girl was up to something. Nagato had confided his anxieties about Conan's recent behavior. Upon discovering the lucrative market for detonating tags, Conan had become a virtual recluse, relentlessly churning out tags within the confines of her room. Her only forays out were clandestine trips to the black market to sell her wares. While Conan's dedication to the Akatsuki's coffers was commendable, Nagato worried about the toll it was taking on her physical and mental well-being. Could her body withstand the relentless production of these potentially volatile tools? Reaching Conan's door, Bayakuya found it locked and windows sealed, starkly contrasting the usual open atmosphere. A sign reading no entry, authorized personnel only hung forebodingly. It was clear Conan had retreated not just from Nagato's concerns but from any outside interaction. No wonder Nagato was so distressed. A gentle knock on the door elicited a weary voice from within. Who is it? It's me. Your friendly, deadly neighborhood 12 years old murderer, Bayakuya. Bayakuya replied with a chuckle. Moments later, the door creaked open, revealing Conan. Dressed in comfortable clothes, she rubbed at the dark circles etched beneath her eyes. Bayakuya? I was expecting Nagato or Yahiko. Did you develop a new paper escape technique this time? She inquired, a hint of hope momentarily replacing the weariness in her voice. Bayakuya hesitated for a moment, his gaze bypassing her to take in the room's contents. The sight that greeted him sent a jolt of apprehension through him. The room was overflowing with detonating talismans, stacked precariously like a papery monument reaching towards the ceiling. Thousands of them lay scattered carelessly across the floor. The sheer volume of these explosive devices was staggering. Even with his mastery of the paper escape technique, a single accidental spark could trigger a devastating chain reaction. Conan's unwavering dedication had taken a surprisingly dangerous turn. After taking in the staggering volume of detonating talismans, Bayakuya turned his gaze to Conan. Nagato-senpai sent me. He's worried about you overworking yourself with these talismans. He wants you to prioritize rest. Conan offered a tired nod. That sounds like Nagato all right. A weary sigh escaped her lips. I understand his concern, but our organization's finances have always been tight. Without the income from detonating talismans, maintaining Akatsuki's operations would become a struggle. I just want to contribute more financially. Bayakuya, honestly, do you think resting is truly necessary right now? Bayakuya considered her question before shaking his head. He then launched into an explanation of basic market principles. Your well-being is paramount, Konan Senpai. While I won't pressure you excessively, it's important to understand that as the supply of detonating talismans increases, their market value inevitably declines. All this tireless effort might not translate to a significant financial gain. Conan remained silent for a few seconds. Nagato's pleas for rest would have likely fallen on deaf ears, but she couldn't ignore the recent shift in the market. The black market merchants had started requesting discounts with increasing frequency. This realization fueled her relentless production, a desperate attempt to compensate for the dropping prices through sheer volume. Is there a solution to this predicament? Breaking the contemplative silence, Conan finally posed the question. Yup, there is. We can proactively instigate a war. This would inflate demand, allowing us to raise prices and ultimately generate more income in selling our precious detonating talismans. The idea held a certain appeal, yet a wave of unease surfaced over Conan. Selling detonating talismans already pushed the boundaries of their moral code. Initiating a war blatantly contradicted Yahiko's core philosophy of peace. Additionally, the very notion of such violence stirred an internal conflict within her. Bayakuya, discerning her disapproval from her expression, pressed on. Another option exists. We could reduce production. Retain a stockpile for our own use, alleviating the strain on your body. Reduce production? Conan echoed, a flicker of understanding crossing her features. It seemed listening to Bayakuya's financial advice was sufficient for now, without delving further into the complexities of his other suggestion. Taking note of her receptiveness, Bayakuya seized the opportunity to delve into economic principles. Though bewilderment clouded Conan's face, she persevered, offering occasional nods to acknowledge her confusion. Finally, as Bayakuya took his leave, 
she watched him depart with a hint of admiration in her eyes. Exiting the room, Bayakuya stroked his chin, a satisfied smirk playing on his lips. While persuading Conan to cut back on detonating talisman production by explaining supply and demand felt like a necessary evil, it ultimately achieved his goal of fulfilling his promise to Nagato. For now, the Akatsuki organization seems to be on a path of stability and progress. Yahiko continued to manage internal affairs, Conan oversaw the finances, and Bayakuya, alongside Nagato, bolstered their military strength. Everything seemed to be falling into place. A few days later, the Akatsuki meeting convened, and the highly anticipated contribution system was swiftly implemented. News of the program spread like wildfire amongst the members. The prospect of exchanging their contributions for ninjutsu, especially powerful techniques like B-level and even A-level jutsu, sparked a wave of excitement. While their initial motivation for joining Akatsuki stemmed from shared ideals, most were formerly wandering ninja within the war-torn land of rain. Access to powerful jutsu had been a distant dream. The contribution system offered a tangible reward for their efforts, starkly contrasting the meager opportunities they found before joining the organization. The variety of ninjutsu in the exchange catalog was particularly astounding. It included high-level techniques, B-level, and even A-level jutsu, typically considered family heirlooms, rarely accessible even to seasoned jonin. The fact that the Akatsuki leadership was willing to share such powerful jutsu with seemingly modest contribution requirements fueled a sense of disbelief amongst the members. Questions swirled in their minds. Where did the leaders procure such a vast and diverse collection of ninjutsu? Were they backed by a hidden ninja village, or perhaps plunderers of an extinct clan's treasure trove? Driven by curiosity and a touch of suspicion, several members returning from missions made a joint visit to Yahiko's office. A polite please come in greeted them from behind the door as Yahiko acknowledged the knock. The Akatsuki members approached cautiously. Um, Lord Yahiko. We're here to exchange some ninjutsu. Yahiko, momentarily looking up from his work, responded with a warm smile. Ah, uh, I have your mission logs right here. Let me know which jutsu you'd like to exchange. He then extended the ninjutsu catalog towards them. The members delved into the catalog, their eyes scanning the listings. Finally, they settled on two C-level jutsu and one tempting B-level technique. Their current contribution level wasn't enough to afford the coveted A-level ninjutsu. Yahiko offered a slight nod before ushering the group into a nearby, concealed chamber. Inside, he retrieved the corresponding jutsu scrolls. Here are the techniques you've chosen. Yahiko explained, his tone serious and authoritative. Remember, these jutsu are strictly for Akatsuki members only. Once you've mastered them, you must return the scrolls. The weight of these conditions, coupled with the sheer power now at their fingertips, left the group feeling slightly lightheaded as they exited Yahiko's office, clutching their prizes tightly. Back in the hidden rain village, access to jutsu was tightly controlled, a constant source of frustration. Even seasoned Chunin with over a decade of service struggled to acquire advanced technique. Lord Yahiko, where exactly did this vast collection of ninjutsu in the organization come from? The Akatsuki member couldn't help blurting out a question before leaving Yahiko's office, the moment the question left his lips. He felt a little regretful and troubled. Certain inquiries were best left unasked. Yahiko, however, merely offered a gentle smile. These jutsu were acquired by Bayakuya. He also proposed the contribution system. If you feel the need to express gratitude, direct it towards him. He patted the member's shoulder reassuringly and said, Bayakuya brought them back? The Akatsuki members exchanged surprised glances, a wave of realization washing over them. Bayakuya's name held a certain weight within the organization, conjuring memories of his vocal opposition to Yahiko at the meeting and the earth-shattering display of power during their sparring session just a few days ago. His name was synonymous with strength, a force that often caused Yahiko headache. Yet, here he was, not only securing a vast repository of jutsu but also advocating for its widespread sharing with fellow members. This revelation struck a chord of astonishment within them. Bayakuya being the source of these jutsu and a proponent of the contribution system is a complete surprise, but I heard there's significant tension between Chief Yahiko and Bayakuya. Bayakuya didn't even attend the meeting, did he? That's what I heard too. Maybe there's more to the story, we know both Yahiko and Bayakuya share a vision for Akatsuki's growth, but they have fundamental disagreements on certain matters. Perhaps this explains their dynamic, theories and speculations swirled amongst the group as they walked back. Upon returning to their quarters, they wasted no time in delving into the practice of their newly acquired jutsu. As successful execution followed successful execution, news of the contribution system's authenticity spread like wildfire. 
more and more ninjas took advantage of the program, exchanging jutsu and becoming increasingly aware of Bayakuya's pivotal role in its implementation. As Bayakuya strolled down the Akatsuki base's path, whispers followed him like a constant murmur. Isn't that Lord Bayakuya? I heard he single-handedly procured all the ninjutsu in the organization. He's so young, yet capable of mastering S-level jutsu. Appearances can be deceiving, truly. Maybe Lord Bayakuya's age is a facade. Perhaps he uses some transformation jutsu to disguise it. How else could he possess such power? Bayakuya remained unfazed by the chatter. His true concern lay in their reactions to the newly acquired ninjutsu. Since the contribution system's launch, the system prompts within his mind had become noticeably more frequent. While most offered fragments of basic escape techniques and chakra control, occasional surprises emerged. A notification materialized in his mind. Kato learned the water style, water rush wave technique. You obtained the water style basic fragment. Sato learned the earth style, heart beheading technique. You obtained the earth style basic fragment. Finally, a more substantial reward appeared. Jonin Kyusuk joined the Akatsuki organization. You obtained the lava release, quicklime congealing technique. Bayakuya swiftly accessed the system panel, his gaze scanning the reward section. The news of Jonin Kyusuk's enlistment immediately caught his eye. He delved deeper into his memories, remnants of the original Naruto series flickering to life. Kyusuk, one of the first generation's elite Jonin within Akatsuki, possessed considerable strength. He even managed to hold his own against Abito for a short time during the organization's attack. Tragically, his attempt at a final, self-sacrificing attack with a family secret technique was thwarted by Abito's Kami. After all, the later possessed some reed cheat level ability that assisted him for causing fourth ninja war. The Lava Release Quicklime congealing technique bestowed by the system undoubtedly originated from Kyusuke's lineage. While acquiring the coveted Lava Release bloodline would have been ideal, the reality was different. This is also acceptable. With a focused mind, Bayakuya formed the necessary hand seals, channeling his chakra to activate the newly acquired technique. The ground before him shimmered, rapidly hardening into a layer of cement that solidified at an impressive speed. Witnessing the rapid solidification, Bayakuya couldn't help but admire this lava technique. This jutsu, intended by Kyusuke for a desperate last stand, held far greater utility in Bayakuya's eyes. More than useful, it's practically a construction marvel. While Kyusuke envisioned a final, self-sacrificial act in the anime, Bayakuya saw endless possibilities. This jutsu could revolutionize the Akatsuki base's dilapidated state. Heck, he could even start a construction company with it. A mischievous glint flickered in his eyes. Later, I'll suggest this to Yahiko. Kyusuke cannot be sacrificed now. With a newfound purpose, Bayakuya closed the system panel and headed towards the training ground. Today's session was already underway. After borrowing Nagato from Yahiko, with a promise to return him in pristine condition, of course, Bayakuya began their specialized training regimen aimed at unlocking Nagato's Rinnegan potential. Compared to a gold mine of potential like Nagato, the feedback strength Bayakuya received from the other Akatsuki members, though valuable, paled in comparison. Reaching the training grounds, Bayakuya found Nagato clad in a training suit, ready for their session. A hint of apprehension danced in Nagato's eyes as he spotted the familiar figure of Bayakuya approaching. It wasn't Bayakuya's formidable strength that caused the unease but the grueling training sessions he seemed to relish. Nagato vividly recalled their last encounter. The last time they sparred, Yahiko approached Nagato and encouraged him to embrace his arrangement and harness the power of the Rinnegan. Nagato, naturally, agreed, only to be plunged headfirst into a week of training that could only be described as a nightmare. With a wary exchange of glances, Nagato, summoning his courage, voiced his trepidation. Bayakuya, are we going to repeat yesterday's weighted training? Bayakuya, his stoic expression etched on his face, nodded. Don't worry, I'll be training alongside you. Without further ado, the two launched into their special training. The routine was deceptively simple. 100 grueling laps around the training ground, burdened by 20-pound weight. This was just the first round, followed by an onslaught of frog jumps, challenging rock climbs, and a myriad of other exercises designed to push their bodies to the limit. Bayakuya's rationale behind these brutal training sessions was clear. Nagato's physical fitness was abysmal. Despite wielding the legendary Rinnegan, his endurance paled in comparison to the six paths of pain. While Nagato's low steam contributed somewhat to this disparity, the core issue lay within Nagato's limited chakra reserve. The Rinnegan, a chakra-guzzling machine, drained Nagato's vitality with alarming speed. 
Ideally, transplanting Hashirama cells would have been the perfect solution. Unfortunately, Bayakuya wasn't in possession of such a rare commodity. Left with limited options, he resorted to the most fundamental method for strengthening the body, old-fashioned physical training, hoping to alleviate the strain placed on Nagato by the Rinnegan. Hours bled into one another as they pounded the training ground with weary legs. Finally, exhaustion claiming victory, they collapsed onto nearby tree stumps, ravenously devouring cold rice balls for sustenance. Bayakuya, ever the blunt one, broke the silence. Nagato-senpai, frankly, you're far too weak. Your physical prowess is frankly pathetic for a descendant of the Uzumaki clan. Running a few dozen kilometers with weighted training is beyond you, you wouldn't even last as long as an average person. Nagato, his face flushed red with exertion and a hint of shame, could only manage a heavy breath. He harbored a silent rebuttal, an indignant reminder that they were both Uzumaki, both imbued with the clan's resilience. But faced with the undeniable reality that Bayakuya, despite his younger age, far surpassed him in physical strength, Nagato held his tongue. He had no ground to stand on. The true crux of Nagato's confusion lay in Bayakuya's seemingly contradictory approach. Bayakuya had spoken passionately about unlocking the Rinnegan's potential, yet their current training regimen focused solely on physical conditioning. Nagato struggled to connect the dots. Bayakuya, we're supposed to be developing the power of the Rinnegan, so why are we doing physical training? Bayakuya met Nagato's gaze with a calm assurance. It's simple, Nagato-senpai. Even for a Rinnegan wielder, the body remains the foundation of a powerful ninja. Remember the aftermath of your Rinnegan usage in the Hidden Grass Village? It's been on my mind ever since. The best solution I could devise to assist you is to strengthen your physical fortitude. Only then can we mitigate the toll the Rinnegan takes on your body. My goal is to enhance your strength without compromising your physical well-being. Nagato absorbed Bayakuya's explanation, a contemplative silence settling over him. Finally, a resolute nod accompanied his reply. Bayakuya, I trust your judgment. I'll dedicate myself to this physical training. With renewed determination, Nagato devoured the remaining rice balls and wasted no time in resuming their grueling exercises. Bayakuya followed silently, a hint of relief softening his features as he observed Nagato's unwavering resolve. During his Akatsuki days, Nagato had exhibited a remarkable willingness to consider others' perspectives, which some might construe as a lack of personal initiative. His focus seemed to lie more on achieving goals for the collective rather than personal advancement. Even after Yahiko's tragic death, Nagato clung fiercely to the ideal of peace, albeit through increasingly extreme methods. Bayakuya recognized this as a quality that could be harnessed. With a little guidance, Nagato would push himself to his absolute limits, even to the point of exhaustion. Suppressing his introspective musings, Bayakuya cast his gaze towards the distant forest, his mind preoccupied with devising a strategy to help Nagato unlock the Rinnegan's true potential all while remaining under Madara's watchful eye. The memory of White Setsu's presence from their previous encounter resurfaced. He vividly recalled the fluctuations in their chakra signatures. Bayakuya, armed with the knowledge of future events, a privilege his plot-induced advantage offered, could effortlessly determine whether White Setsu lurked nearby. The answer was clear, he was absent. Nagato's existence was a constant target for White Setsu's watchful eyes, a 24-7 surveillance that extended even to his meals and sleep. While Nagato himself wasn't significant enough to warrant Madara Uchiha's direct attention, his connection to the Rinnegan could raise suspicion. Maintaining a friendly relationship with Nagato was acceptable, but delving too deeply into the secrets of the Rinnegan was an invitation for Madara's scrutiny. Weakened by the loss of his Rinnegan and the ravages of time, it was uncertain whether Madara still possessed the strength that once made him a legend of the shinobi world. Dealing with him, Bayakuya mused, wouldn't necessarily require unleashing the full power of his Susanoo. A plan began to form in Bayakuya's mind. With a practiced sequence of hand seals, he summoned a paper clone, dispatching it to their living quarters to retrieve a dusty tome chronicling the legend of the Six Paths Sage. The shinobi world was awash with myths and legends surrounding this enigmatic figure. Bayakuya intended to leverage these historical accounts to guide Nagato in unlocking the true potential of the Rinnegan. As the paper clone returned with the hefty book, Bayakuya eagerly flipped through its pages, encountering tales of the Six Paths Sage's divine power, the power he used to create the world, humanity, and even the very foundation of the shinobi way of life. A smirk played on Bayakuya's lips as he skimmed through a few passages. It seemed these historical accounts were heavily embellished. The Six Paths Sage wasn't a literal creator deity, nor did he single-handedly birth humanity. 
His true contributions lay in the creation of the Nine-Tailed Beasts and the establishment of the Shinobi Code, aspects Bayakuya could readily utilize. However, the Six Paths Sage's mythical status offered a degree of creative freedom. To effectively guide Nagato's training, Bayakuya reasoned, he could add a touch of his own interpretation to the narrative. With this strategy in mind, Bayakuya instructed his paper clone to continue the rigorous training with Nagato while he himself retreated to the cover of the nearby bushes. There, nestled in the foliage, he meticulously formulated a plan, a plan to manipulate the existing mythology and steer Nagato towards mastering the Rinnegan. Several grueling hours later, Nagato finally completed the grueling training regimen. As he returned to the training ground, he spotted Bayakuya perched on a chair, engrossed in a book. Bayakuya waved him over, a glint of triumph in his eyes. Nagato-senpai, I have discovered means to significantly develop your Rinnegan training. Tears welled up in Nagato's eyes. After weeks of relentless training, he had finally reached the stage where he could truly begin to unlock the power of the Rinnegan. Bayakuya finally had the means to unlock Nagato's Rinnegan's true potential. Madara Uchiha, his eyes narrowed in concentration on the live broadcast from the grassland, scoffed. A seasoned schemer nearing his twilight years, Madara's greatest pastime was no longer the battlefield. Instead, it was cultivating pawns to realize the grand vision inscribed on the Uchiha clan tablet, the infinite Tsukuyami, a world under his absolute control. In this intricate plan, Nagato, the young man burdened with the Rinnegan, the legendary six paths of Sage's power, was the linchpin for his resurrection. To ensure Nagato wielded the Rinnegan for his ultimate purpose, Madara had subtly manipulated the young Abito, a promising Uchiha with a tragic past. He'd nurtured Abito's rage and despair, molding him into a vessel for his will, a new Madara who would control Nagato and activate the Rinnegan at the opportune moment. White Zetsu, his reliable spy and foot soldier, had already been dispatched to retrieve the critically injured Abito. Once Abito was revived and honed into a capable ninja, Madara could finally embrace death, confident in his return through the samsara of heavenly life technique embedded within Nagato. However, the tedious wait for Abito's recovery forced Madara to shift his focus. He couldn't afford any unforeseen complications with Nagato, especially considering the young man's volatile Jinchuriki status. This scrutiny also brought another figure into his purview by Akuya. Madara, ever the keen observer, was intrigued by this jonin-level shinobi who dared to manipulate Hidden Grass Village and hold his own against Nagato. White Zetsu was tasked with uncovering Bayakuya's past as well. Bayakuya's presence, a wild card in his carefully orchestrated plan, piqued Madara's curiosity. Truth be told, when Bayakuya offered to assist Nagato in unlocking the full potential of the Rinnegan, a trigger of anticipation, a rare emotion for the stoic Madara, stirred within him. A sliver of worry surrounded him, if Nagato truly unearthed powerful Rinnegan techniques under Bayakuya's unorthodox tutelage, it could complicate his resurrection. But a part of him, a remnant of the ambitious Madara who once sought to reshape the world, was also curious to see what this young man could accomplish with the fabled eye. Perhaps Bayakuya's methods, unconventional as they seemed, might yield unexpected results. Yet, as he witnessed Bayakuya pull out a mythical book and pledge to guide Nagato, Madara, the observer from afar, couldn't help but scoff. The myths were riddled with inaccuracies. The true path to mastering the Rinnegan lay engraved on the Uchiha stone. Mastering the Rinnegan wasn't a simple feat even a prodigy like him, hailed as the strongest Uchiha of his generation, required decades to fully harness its power. The scoff morphed into a full-blown snort as White Zetsu materialized beside him, his voice laced with urgency. Lord Madara, someone is aiding Nagato with the Rinnegan. This could disrupt your plans. Madara responded with a chilling snort, his disdain for white Zetsu palpable. These white Zetsu clones, sharing the same dull personality as Hashirama. What do they know? Mastering the Rinnegan is no child's play. It takes years of rigorous training, an iron will, and a deep understanding of its true potential. These fools wouldn't recognize that potential even if it stared them in the face. Then a drop of amusement danced in Madara's lone eye. Perhaps Bayakuya's unorthodox approach, fueled by these mythical texts, might unintentionally lead Nagato down a path closer to the truth than Madara anticipated. It was a gamble, but one Madara was willing to take. After all, a little chaos could be a catalyst for unexpected discoveries. The training ground bustled with the remnants of their intense session. Nagato, skepticism etched on his face, eyed Bayakuya who had just lowered the mythological tome. Are you sure these sources are reliable, Bayakuya? He inquired, 
the tremor in his voice betraying a slice of doubt despite his attempt to appear confident. It wasn't that he didn't trust Bayakuya, but the proposed method struck him as wildly unorthodox. Bayakuya met his gaze with unwavering seriousness. I understand your reservations, Nagato-senpai. Frankly, even I find this approach rather outlandish. However, the ninja world possesses scant information on the Rinnegan, mostly shrouded in myth and legend. Nagato approached Bayakuya. His brow furrowed in concentration as he picked up the worn book and flipped through its pages. Even so, doesn't it seem a bit exaggerated? Can we truly rely on mere myths to unlock the potential of the Rinnegan? A contemplative silence descended upon them. Bayakuya broke it, gesturing for Nagato to turn to the book's first page. See here. This passage recounts the legendary Six Paths Sage, his creation of the world, shaping mountains and carving rivers. In the past, such feats were dismissed as mere fables, beyond the reach of any ninja. He continued, his voice rising in emphasis, but Nagato-senpai, you yourself wield the power of gravity and repulsion. You can manipulate boulders and reshape the landscape. As your mastery grows, could moving mountains and carving seas truly be outside the realm of possibility? Don't you see? This might very well be a power inherent in the Rinnegan. Nagato's expression softened in dawning comprehension. Confusion surfaced in his eyes as he spoke. I understand what you're saying. I can manipulate gravity and repulsion, but beyond that, I have no clue what other abilities the Rinnegan possesses. What direction should I take my training? A playful smirk tugged at the corner of Bayakuya's lips. Nagato-senpai, you truly lack imagination. He teased good-naturedly. He flipped to the second page, revealing an illustration of the six paths sage breathing life into humanity. The next logical step, of course, is to explore using the Rinnegan to create life itself. Nagato's jaw dropped in astonishment. Create life? But how? What specific techniques would I need? He stammered, his voice thick with disbelief. Bayakuya's brow furrowed as he pondered. There's a rumor about the Nara clan in Kanahagakur. They possess the unique skill of shadow manipulation, a in release technique that allows them to alter the shape of shadows. Additionally, the Akimichi clan utilizes Yang release to manipulate their physical forms. He continued, his voice laced with excitement. Perhaps, by merging Yin and Yang release techniques, we might unlock the secret to creating new life. Nagato's brow furrowed in contemplation. Bayakuya's words carried a certain weight of truth. He'd heard whispers about the capabilities of Yin and Yang release from Jiraiya, his sensei. But the notion of fusing these two opposing chakra natures to create life was a concept he'd never encountered before. The very thought of merging Yin and Yang presented a daunting challenge in itself. Nagato's brow furrowed further at Bayakuya's lighthearted advice. Don't worry about it, Nagato. Just focus on channeling Yin and Yang chakra within your body using the Rinnegan. Even if you don't succeed in creating life, it's still a valuable learning experience. Bayakuya chuckled, dispelling the tension. Nagato nodded solemnly, settling onto the ground on his cross-legged back. He immediately began the arduous task of simultaneously channeling the Yin and Yang chakras. Meanwhile, miles away, Madara watched the live broadcast with a growing sense of unease. The myth depicted the six paths sage breathing life into existence and the possibility that the Rinnegan could truly create life nod at him. White Zetsu, after all, was a testament to the Rinnegan's power, but the sheer outlandishness of the concept, coupled with the mythological source, made him scoff. He wrestled with the implications for several minutes. Back on the training ground, sweat beaded on Nagato's forehead as he persisted in his attempt. Despite his valiant efforts, creating life remained elusive. However, as he finally ceased exerting, a black rod materialized in his palm. He looked up at Bayakuya, panting, and spoke with a hint of apology. I failed to create life, but I managed this with Inyang release. Bayakuya's initial disappointment was expertly masked. Inwardly, however, he was elated. This black rod, a product of Inyang release, possessed the remarkable ability to both seal and transmit chakra remotely. It was, in fact, the cornerstone for creating the six paths of pain. Not a complete loss at all, Nagato-senpai. This black rod is a significant development. We need to persist with our training, and we'll undoubtedly unlock even more abilities. Now, let's delve into the functions of this fascinating creation. Bayakuya said with a reassuring smile, Nagato mirrored Bayakuya's smile, a sense of relief washing over him. Deep within his subterranean lair, Madara grappled with a complex mix of emotions. A flicker of hope had ignited at the sight of the black thing, leading him to believe Nagato might have indeed created a white setsu. However, disappointment replaced hope when he realized it was merely a black rod. It served as a stark reminder that Nagato was merely a vessel, 
incapable of fully wielding the Rinnegan's power. However, he felt a little envious Nagato, a mere teenager, had managed to create something entirely new in a remarkably short time. This realization stung Madara's pride, the legendary Achiha. Seems you miscalculated, Lord Madara. It appears Bayakuya and Nagato have actually developed a new jutsu based on the myth book. White Zetsu piped up inopportunely, drawing attention to the Black Rod. Madara's icy gaze snapped towards White Setsu, who immediately shrank back, sensing the murderous aura emanating from his master. Once White Setsu had scurried away, Madara focused on the upcoming task of training Abito. After all, as the harbinger of a new world order, Madara couldn't bear the thought of being outdone by a teenager. He resolved to implement a more rigorous and specialized training regimen for Abito, his heir apparent. Only through exceptional training could he ensure Abito possessed the strength to control Nagato and fulfill his grand design. Several hours bled into night. Madara Uchiha, a stoic figure perched on a chair, fixed his gaze on the holographic projection before him. White Zetsu had completed his task. Abito's mangled form lay recuperating nearby. Patience, a quality Madara had honed over decades, was key now. He waited for Abito to stir. A groan echoed through the cavernous space, signaling Abito's return to consciousness. The oppressive darkness of the ceiling was the first thing to greet his blurry vision. Panic clawed at him as he tried to rise, only to discover his body was a traitor, refusing to obey his commands. He could only manage a sluggish turn, his lone remaining eye scanning his surroundings in a desperate attempt to understand his predicament. His gaze landed on Uchiha Madara, the Sharingan in the old man's eye of beacon in the gloom. A torrent of questions flooded Abito's mind. Where was he? Who was this imposing Uchiha elder? He prided himself on recognizing most of the village's senior members, but this figure remained a complete stranger. Most importantly, was he dead? Or was he somehow alive, adrift in a nightmarish limbo? Madara, sensing Abito's awareness, deactivated the white setsu projection with a flip of his wrist. He rose with a slowness born of age and approached the young Uchiha. Young Uchiha, you finally awakened. Madara rumbled in a voice surprisingly gentle for its gravelly quality, but it scared the hell out of drama queen Abito. Who are you? Some reaper destined to claim Achiha souls? Please, have mercy. I beg you, don't take my life. Logic dictated that only a fellow Achiha could possess the Sharingan. Yet, there hadn't been any news of defectors, especially not one as frail as this old man. The most logical explanation, then, was that he faced a malevolent spirit, a grim reaper of the Achiha clan. Madara was speechless, momentarily stunned by Abito's frantic pleas. A genius who'd awakened the rare two Tomo Sharingan in his youth, and yet, here he was, getting scared of some ghost at Abito's age, Madara had already led his clan into battle against the Sunjas. It was this very naivety, however, that made Abito the perfect candidate for his grand design. After all, wasn't it extreme love that fueled the most potent hatred? Witnessing the brutality of the ninja world would surely forge a formidable Mangekyo Sharingan within the young Uchiha. But for now, Madara knew patience was required. He would orchestrate Abito's awakening slowly, meticulously. A contemplative silence descended upon them. Finally, Madara spoke, his voice laced with a hint of weariness. There was a time when they called me the Death God. Now, however, I am but a shadow of my former self, an Uchiha ghost haunting the ninja world. You can call me Madara. Madara Uchiha. Abito's breath hitched. Madara? As if that. Madara, the Uchiha leader? He's been dead for years. Madara's lips curled into a sardonic sneer. So you find it easier to believe I'm a reaper of souls than Uchiha Madara himself? Times have truly changed. The new generation forgets legends all too quickly. But that's of little consequence now. So many years have passed. He shifted in his seat, leaning forward with an intensity that belied his years. However, before the earth claimed you when the boulder crushed you, I saved your life. How do you plan to repay my kindness? Abito's gaze darted down to his bandaged midsection. A flicker of recognition sparked in his eyes as he recalled the events before his descent into unconsciousness. This Madara, this spectral figure, had indeed saved him. What repayment do you seek for such a kindness? Abito inquired, a flicker of wariness creeping into his voice. Surely you wouldn't expect me to become your servant? I am indebted to you for saving my life but the war rages on outside. My comrades need me. They need my protection. He attempted to rise, a surge of determination pushing against his weakened body. You can leave if you want. Just leave your Sharingan and half of your body. Although I don't lack Sharingan, I also want to collect a few more Sharingan as a backup. Madara smirked, 
I can leave if that's all you desire. But wouldn't taking my Sharingan, half my body, be a bit excessive? You already possess Sharingan. Why collect more as mere backups? Abito's defiance surprised Madara, but a flicker of amusement danced in his lone eye. This boy, brash and naive, possessed a fire that could be molded. He watched with detached patience as Abito slumped back onto the bed, his bravado fading into a desperate plea. What kind of repayment do you require? Is there a way to repay your debt and still be free? Surely you don't intend to imprison me indefinitely. Madara met Abito's gaze, his patience unwavering. He had a plan, a meticulously crafted path to mold Abito into his successor. All he needed was the right moment, the moment to expose Abito to the true darkness of the ninja world, a darkness that would fuel despair and ultimately lead him to embrace Madara's vision, the Eye of the Moon plan. But then, a memory surfaced in Madara's mind, a fragment of the scene he'd witnessed through the white setsu projection. A new idea, a twisted seed of manipulation, began to take root. White setsu materialized from the shadows, a silent specter tasked by Madara. In its spindly hand, it held a scroll, an advanced fire release technique. White Zetsu presented the scroll to Abito, who accepted it with one hand, his brow furrowed in concern. Repaying your debt won't be a quick endeavor. Master this Jutsu first. Before I succumb to sleep again, I expect to see you perform it flawlessly. Don't disappoint me. With that pronouncement, Madara slumped back in his chair, his eyelids fluttering shut. Only a handful of white Setsu remained, their vacant eyes fixed on Abito. Madara, sustained by the life force of the demonic statue of the Outer Path, loathed his frail shell. Aside from keeping tabs on a few key figures, he spent most of his existence in a state of slumber. Abito, wincing with each movement, propped himself against the damp wall. With his one good hand, he unfurled the scroll, revealing the complex seals for fire release. Great fire annihilation, a high-level B-rank jutsu. He'd only witnessed Jonin within his clan wield such power. Mastering it would demand considerable time and chakra reserve. He stole a glance at the slumbering Madara, then at the grotesque white setsu surrounding him. The memory of his ravaged body, devoid of sensation, stoked a deep despair. Resigned to his captivity, Abito delved into the intricacies of the scroll. Since escape seemed an immediate impossibility, focusing on honing his skills became his sole solace. Perhaps in time, he'd possess the strength to protect Rin and Kakashi. He could even use his newfound abilities to impress Minato, his revered sensei. Days bled into one another. Then, one morning, Madara stirred from his slumber, his gaze snapping towards Abito. Have you mastered the jutsu? It's been three days only, and I am not seeing any progression. Abito flinched, startled by the sudden interruption. Regaining his composure, he countered, This is such a complex jutsu. Three days are simply insufficient. Mastering it will take at least three weeks. Madara snorted derisively. Pathetic talent. At this glacial pace, repaying your debt in this lifetime seems unlikely. Abito, surprisingly, had begun to adjust to his bizarre circumstances. He met Madara's scorn with a hint of defiance. Even Kakashi, a prodigy, wouldn't master this jutsu in three days. Your expectations are unreasonable. Unreasonable, am I? Madara's voice dripped with icy amusement. He beckoned a white zetsu forward, who promptly activated a holographic projection. The scene depicted a training session between Nagato and a cloaked figure, Bayakuya. After a grueling physical training session that stretched for kilometers, Bayakuya produced a peculiar book, its pages filled with fantastical tales of the Six Paths Sage. He then proceeded to manipulate Nagato with its fantastical content. Abito, his curiosity peaked after weeks of isolation, edged closer to Madara's side. The bleakness of his underground confinement had fostered a yearning for any glimpse of the outside world. The projection held his full attention. Bewilderment clouded Abito's face as he watched the scene unfold in White Setsu's projection. Was this a genuine ninjutsu lesson? Or some cruel joke? However, the two figures sparring on screen stirred a strange familiarity within him. Weren't those, Bayakuya and Nagato? The same duo who'd saved Rin a while back? A sudden realization struck him. Why do Nagato's eyes look like spirals? Could it be they disguised themselves during their encounter? And what in the world was Uchiha Madara doing, intently observing these two? Like, the people in the projection were still teens and an old man like Madara observing them seemed a bit creepy if you ask Abito. As if reading his mind, Madara spoke with an unnerving calmness. The Rinnegan, quite a sight, isn't it? Those were once my eyes. Now, mere replacements. Abito furrowed his brow, confusion etching a line on his forehead. Replacements? But your eyes, they were Sharingan, weren't they? 
ordinary Sharingan evolved. It goes from three Tomo, then Mangekyo. What's so outlandish about them eventually becoming the Rinnegan? Madara explained, his voice devoid of urgency. If those were originally yours, why are they in someone else's head? Abito pressed, suspicion hardening his resolve. A slow smile crept across Madara's face. For the eye of the moon plan, I will create a world free of pain with no suffering. A world where everyone exists within a blissful illusion, aging peacefully until their inevitable deaths. Abito scoffed, dismissing Madara's plan as the delusional rantings of a broken old man. A fabricated reality leading to an equally fabricated death? You're truly a joke, old man. I'm getting out of here once I repay my debt for saving my life. I want to live in reality. Madara remained undisturbed by the youthful jabs. Back to the matter at hand. Nagato's talent surpasses yours, wouldn't you agree? Even without a ninjutsu scroll, he unlocked the Rinnegan's potential. For the first time, Abito found himself speechless. There was no denying Nagato's prodigious talent, far exceeding his own. However, in the next moment, Abito seemed to think of something and retorted. Maybe Nagato is more gifted but maybe your teaching methods are old and poor. Throwing a dusty scroll at me, who learns like that? If you'd actually guided me properly, wouldn't my progress be faster? A satisfied smirk played on Madara's lip. The seed of doubt had been planted. Abito sought his guidance, a perfect opening for manipulation. He only needed to bide his time, weaving a web of lies that would inevitably lead Abito down a path of despair, a path that would ultimately serve his grand scheme. Inside the Akatsuki base, the scene shifted to Nagato's training ground. Sunlight filtered through the leaves, dappling the ground where Nagato sat cross-legged. He raised an eyebrow as Bayakuya materialized beside him, a black rod clutched in one hand and a weathered scroll clutched in the other. Bayakuya, are we continuing to research the abilities of the black rods today? Nagato inquired. The sight of Bayakuya engrossed in the mythical texts exploring the Rinnegan's abilities had become familiar. Nagato himself shared Bayakuya's growing suspicion. The Sage of Six Paths, he believed, had documented the Rinnegan's potential within these historical texts, a legacy for future generations to inherit. Until Nagato's own awakening, however, the texts had been relegated to the realm of mere myth. The Inyang release technique, while impressive, only managed to create the Black Rods, not true life. Perhaps his own power simply wasn't on par with the legendary Sage. A nagging sense of incompleteness lingered, a feeling that something was missing, something essential for the creation of true life. Despite their limitations, the Black Rods were far from useless. They possessed the unique ability to restrict chakra flow, act as communication channels, and even manipulate animals within the forest by transforming them into controllable beasts through rod insertion. Today, we'll develop other abilities. We won't be studying the Black Rods for now, Bayakuya replied, shaking his head. He sheathed the Inyang release longsword he'd recently tasked Nagato with forging and fell silent, contemplating the best course of action. Fabricating techniques to guide Nagato in unlocking the Rinnegan's remaining powers posed a significant challenge. Abilities like those granted by the Naraka Path and the Human Path were particularly intriguing. They held the potential to significantly enhance Nagato's prowess. As Bayakuya deliberated, he couldn't help but sense a familiar presence hidden within the gnarled trunk of a nearby tree, a white setsu, its surveillance becoming an unwelcome routine. Nagato's growing power had recently yielded Bayakuya an unexpected reward. The mind's eye of the Kagura, this potent sensory jutsu, the pinnacle of Uzumaki clan techniques, amplified his perception, extending his sensory range for dozens of kilometers. Thanks to this newfound ability, he could pinpoint the exact location of the white setsu. However, the constant scrutiny fueled a growing suspicion. It was clear that Madara was keeping a watchful eye on them, a fact that reinforced the necessity of his cautious approach. Directly revealing the Rinnegan's abilities and providing explicit guidance to Nagato would not only raise Madara's suspicions but potentially sow distrust in Nagato himself. A solution presented itself after delving into the texts, uncovering a passage about the Sage of Six Paths' ability to absorb chakra from others. Inspired by this discovery, Bayakuya approached Nagato with a plan to unlock the Rinnegan's chakra absorption ability. Nagato's mastery of the technique was swift. As Bayakuya weaved hand seals and conjured a torrent of water, Nagato focused, absorbing the chakra infused within the jutsu. With a swift, silent motion, the water stream dissipated instantly, leaving behind only the faintest ripple on the forest floor. I've mastered another new ability. Nagato's face broke into a wide grin as he exclaimed, a genuine thrill evident in his voice. Bayakuya mirrored Nagato's satisfaction, a chime echoing within his mind. System prompt. 
Akatsuki gains a Kaga level strongman, rewarding Uzumaki clan sealing technique. A flicker of surprise momentarily crossed by Akuya's features. Kaga level? Had Nagato truly reached that level of power already? Reflection cleared his initial shock. It made sense. Nagato was 16 now, his body mature enough to handle the basic demands of the Rinnegan. He'd already mastered a formidable arsenal. Shinra Tensei, Bansho Tenin, Chakra Absorption, and Black Rod Creation. Each of these abilities could elevate an individual to elite jonin status. Combined, they undoubtedly pushed Nagato into the Kage tier. However, this milestone also presented a challenge. Significant leaps in power would become increasingly difficult. To reach the coveted Super Kage level, Nagato would need to refine his mastery over the Rinnegan's vast potential and seamlessly integrate them into his combat style. This Super Kage level, not mentioned in the original series, denoted a ninja surpassing the prowess of the Five Kage. In the system's language, it implied possessing the combat strength to take on an entire shinobi village single-handedly. At his peak wielding the Six Paths of Pain, Nagato could arguably reach this level. Pushing the thought aside, Bayakuya claimed the system's reward, the Uzumaki clan sealing technique. It wasn't just a single technique, but rather a comprehensive package resembling the basic paper release, encompassing a variety of Uzumaki sealing method. You have obtained the sealing technique. Four symbols seal, you have obtained the sealing technique. Adamantin sealing chains, you have obtained the sealing technique. Dead demon consuming seal, you have obtained the sealing technique. Contract seal. The sheer number of sealing techniques flooding his repertoire overwhelmed by Akuya. He knew these would require significant practice in the future. There was no escaping his connection to the Uzumaki clan. Any attempt to distance himself would be met with disbelief. A tinge of disappointment pricked him. No Rinnegan reward this time. He understood that these rewards were rare, likely reserved for when Akatsuki boasted a member surpassing the Super Kage level. Some experience with the system had revealed its pattern. Rewards were tightly linked to the organization's member's strength. Ordinary members yielded basic elemental techniques like fire release or water release. Only Jonin and higher caliber members triggered valuable rewards for him. Yet, even basic attributes, when accumulated, could snowball into a terrifying force. Shaking off his momentary lapse, Bayakuya decided to contribute a few of the simpler sealing techniques to the organization. If others within Akatsuki could utilize these techniques, it would strengthen the group as a whole, potentially leading to even more advantageous rewards for him. Several days passed, and Bayakuya found himself surprisingly adept at the Uzumaki sealing techniques bestowed by the system. While the dead demon-consuming seal remained a challenge due to its rigorous activation requirements, he'd honed his proficiency with the others. Repeated practice yielded satisfying results. These seals could effectively hinder White Zetsu's unwelcome intrusions and prying eyes. However, Bayakuya opted for a subtle approach. He refrained from plastering the entire base with these barriers, choosing instead to place them around his own room strategically. His keen sensory perception, courtesy of the mind's eye of the Kagura, allowed him to pinpoint White Zetsu's location, eliminating the need for excessive caution. An overly guarded stance could arouse Madara's suspicion, inadvertently revealing his awareness of White Zetsu's presence. Maintaining this delicate balance was key. As for the possibility of White Zetsu breaching his room during his absence, Bayakuya had meticulously erased any remnants of his transmigration. His room now contained only a single, innocuous item, a diary chronicling Akatsuki's daily activities. With his room secured, Bayakuya made his way to Karen's quarters, his knuckles rapping gently on the door. A flurry of activity ensued from within, followed by Karen's breathless reply moments later. She swung the door open, embarrassment flushing her cheeks. Bayakuya-sama, why the sudden visit? A quick glance at the disarrayed room and Karen's flustered state told Bayakuya all he needed to know. He politely closed the door, affording her a moment to compose herself. A few minutes later, a visibly tidier Karen emerged, round glasses perched on her nose and a scholarly aura replacing her earlier fluster. She ushered Bayakuya in, her voice a soft murmur. Please excuse the earlier mess, Bayakuya-sama. It was quite embarrassing. The room wasn't the only thing messy, was it? A wry smile shone across Bayakuya's lips, but he refrained from saying it aloud. Instead, he opted not to dwell on the situation. His primary objectives were to assess Karen's progress and introduce her to the Uzumaki sealing technique. Don't worry about it. He replied with a reassuring smile, accepting the steaming cup of tea she offered. I came to check on your training and to share some Uzumaki clan sealing techniques with you. Karen's eyes gleamed with excitement at the prospect of learning new jutsu. Thank you, Bayakuya-sama. 
I'll dedicate myself fully to mastering them. Bayakuya nodded in approval. These sealing techniques are powerful tools that will undoubtedly serve you well. Let's begin with the fundamentals and gradually progress to more advanced methods. Several hours melted away as Bayakuya meticulously guided Karen through the intricacies of the Uzumaki clan's sealing technique. He emphasized each step, ensuring she grasped the principles and could execute them flawlessly. Her swift learning and dedication impressed him. He had no doubt she'd soon wield these potent abilities with mastery. As their session concluded, Bayakuya offered a final reminder. Practice these techniques diligently, Karen. They'll not only safeguard you but also bolster our organization's defenses. Karen responded with a fervent nod. I promise I will, Bayakuya-sama. Thank you for entrusting me with this knowledge. Leaving Karen's room, Bayakuya's lips contained a satisfactory smile. Karen's progress, coupled with the newly acquired sealing techniques, undeniably strengthened their position as a group. This, in turn, would better equip them to face any looming threat. After all, Nagato's growth had plateaued. Their advancement now hinged on nurturing other capable members. The comfortable silence stretched for a moment too long. Finally, Bayakuya broke it. Karen, how are you faring with the medical ninjutsu and books I gave you? A flicker of surprise crossed Karen's features. Is that the real reason for your visit, Bayakuya-sama? Yeah, why else? He countered with a teasing sip of tea. Or perhaps I simply missed having a company of a shut-in girl. It's been a week since I last talked with you. Karen adjusted her glasses, a sheepish smile tugging at the corners of her lips. Past experiences had instilled a fear of venturing outside the base. Coupled with the convenience of living within its walls, where tending to the occasional patient ensured her survival, she saw no reason to leave. I have finished reading the medical books, by Kuyasama, and I even mastered the mystical palm technique, she said, a small white mouse suddenly materializing in her hand. With a practiced flick of her wrist, she made a shallow cut on the creature's leg. Emitting a vibrant green glow from her palm, she swiftly healed the wound, leaving the mouse none the worse for wear. Bayakuya gaped in astonishment. Mastering the mystical palm technique, an A-rank jutsu, was no small feat it spoke volumes of Karen's aptitude for medical knowledge. A prodigy in the field, she undoubtedly possessed an exceptional talent for healing. However, despite achieving such an accomplishment, her system evaluation remained unchanged. This development piqued Bayakuya's curiosity. A shadow of disappointment clouded Karen's face as she noticed Bayakuya's bewilderment. D does that mean I wasn't good enough? I've only managed to learn this one jutsu so far. I'm still struggling with the others. Now Bayakuya understood. He'd made a mistake in his haste. No, Karen. Don't misunderstand. Mastering the mystical palm technique is a remarkable achievement. It speaks about your talent for medical ninjutsu. He paused, then inquired. But... Why haven't you mastered defensive jutsu for your own protection? Karen shook her head in response. No, Bayakuya-sama. I've been entirely focused on mastering the medical ninjutsu you provided. There wasn't any mention of learning other types of jutsu. Bayakuya nodded, a flicker of understanding passing through his eyes. That explains it. While medical ninjutsu is invaluable, it's equally important to equip yourself with techniques to ensure your safety. Her sole focus on medical techniques had left her vulnerable in terms of self-defense. Karen was still confused. But by Akuyasama, you only instructed me to study the medical books and learn medical ninjutsu on my own. There wasn't anything mentioned about other forms of training. By Akuya now know everything. Karen hadn't received any instructions regarding combat-oriented jutsu. No wonder her system evaluation remained stagnant at Chunin level. Her strength hadn't increased, a crucial step toward achieving Jounin rank. However, his decision to share the Uzumaki sealing techniques remained a sound one. Good. Now, pack your things. We're heading to the training ground. Karen's eyes widened. The training ground? Yup. Nagato trains there daily, and you'll be joining him. You've been cooped up indoors for too long. And yes, you have gained some weight too? Karen's hand instinctively flew to her stomach, and she sighed dramatically after a quick inspection in the mirror. Gained weight? Karen immediately became alert. After checking herself in the mirror, she sighed. I have gained a bit of weight, but that's the price of comfort. I'm willing to pay a bit more for it. Nevertheless, she gathered her belongings without further argument, ready to follow Bayakuya to the training grounds. As they approached the training area, Karen spotted Nagato diligently completing lap. Her shoulders slumped slightly. Bayakuya-sama, am I expected to to train my body like Nagato? Bayakuya let out a sigh. It's not quite the same, Karen. With the Rinnegan and his status as the child of prophecy, Nagato needs a rigorous physical regimen to handle his immense power. 
Your training will be focused on building a solid foundation in various aspects, not just physical fitness. But remember, Karen, you lack the natural advantages Nagato possesses. Your Uzumaki lineage is your only head start. You'll need to work considerably harder to reach your full potential. Bayakuya paused, considering his next words. Unfortunately, sealing techniques are the only way for you to bolster your self-defense capabilities at this point. Karen's eyes softened. Having you by my side is all the protection I need, Bayakuya-sama. But halfway through her sentence, Karen seemed to remember something and widened her eyes. Wait a minute, Bayakuya-sama. You were just about to introduce me to some sealing techniques, weren't you? But there aren't any in the organization's secret vault. A mischievous glint sparkled in Bayakuya's eyes. So, who do you think delivered those jutsu to the vault? He countered with a playful shrug. He tapped her forehead lightly. Let's not waste time. Consider this a lesson a procrastination is a foe. Now, focus. I'm going to teach you the adamantine sealing technique. The name sent a jolt through Karen, momentarily freezing her in place. Adamantine sealing? She gasped, reeling from the unexpected revelation. After a moment to collect herself, she spoke again, her voice laced with concern. By Akuyasama, this is a highly classified technique within the Uzumaki clan. How did you acquire this knowledge? Bayakuya feigned ignorance, furrowing his brow in mock confusion. A secret technique of the Uzumaki clan, you say? It appears to be just another jutsu from my family's dusty bookshelf. Perhaps one of my parents crossed paths with an Uzumaki ninja during their travels. A silent rebuttal formed in Karen's mind. No, you are an Uzumaki, she thought defiantly. Techniques of this caliber wouldn't be casually shared with outsiders. Even within the Uzumaki clan, only elite Jonin level members were entrusted with such knowledge. After a thoughtful pause, Karen spoke with newfound seriousness. Bayakuya-sama, there's something Nagato-senpai and I have been meaning to tell you for a while now. We suspect you might be a descendant of the Uzumaki clan, just like us. We couldn't be certain before, but now. She trailed off, her gaze locked on his. One of your parents must have been a high-ranking Uzumaki ninja. Karen had anticipated a reaction of shock or surprise, but Bayakuya's response left her bewildered. He simply offered a faint smile and dismissed her words with a nonchalant wave. Perhaps, but the Uzumaki clan is a relic of the past, long since gone. Even we, you and Nagato, have shed the Uzumaki name. His voice hardened slightly. Instead of dwelling on the past, let's focus on what truly matters, becoming stronger. Yes, the Uzumaki clan has been virtually wiped out for generations. We can no longer truly call ourselves Uzumaki ninjas. Those were the words of 12 years old boy. Karen sighed with a smile. Saying those words aloud felt like a physical weight had been lifted from her shoulders, a burden she'd carried for far too long. The Uzumaki clan name, once a source of pride, now carried a dark stain. After the land of whirlpools fell, the scattered Uzumaki survivors faced not only the struggles of rebuilding their lives but also the constant threat from those who coveted their power. After all, Uzumaki ninjas were renowned for their immense chakra reserves and formidable sealing techniques, making them prime candidates for gruesome experiments and unwilling vessels for powerful-tailed beasts, Jinchuriki. Both fates spelled a life of agonizing misery. Taking a deep breath to steady herself, Karen met Bayakuya's gaze directly. Lord Bayakuya, let's begin learning the adamantine sealing technique right now. I'm prepared to dedicate myself completely to mastering it. Bayakuya, observing Karen's steely resolve, offered a curt nod of approval. He had finally managed to subtly steer the conversation away from the sensitive topic of their Uzumaki heritage. He too, had chosen not to reveal his lineage. This way, if any other bloodline traits or unique Kekiai Genkai manifested within him in the future, he wouldn't be forced to explain their origin, providing him with a layer of strategic secrecy. Underground space, Uchiha Madara, the shinobi world's Azura, furrowed his brow. His expression was a mask of grim frustration. Teaching Abito to master fire release. Great fire annihilation was proving far more difficult than battling Kaga-level opponent. In Madara's eyes, the jutsu was a mere trifle. All it required were two or three hand seals and the manipulation of fire-natured chakra. It shouldn't have taken over a week to master. He was getting suspicious of Abito. Was this Brad holding back, purposefully dragging his feet? Abito's eagerness to return to Kanahaga suggested otherwise. He should have been putting in twice the effort. Abito, diligently practicing hand seals nearby, remained oblivious. He naively believed mastering such a high-level jutsu would be simple. Compared to the Great Fireball technique, which had taken him months to learn, the Great Fire Annihilation felt like an insurmountable wall. Abito couldn't deny a sliver of laziness on his part, 
but it also highlighted a stark difference in talent compared to Kakashi. He just wouldn't admit it aloud. However, this time, Abito didn't blame himself. He suspected the problem stemmed from Madara's teaching method. The Jutsu scroll clearly outlined over ten hand seals, but Madara used only three during his demonstration. How could Abito, even with his Sharingan, replicate a technique with incomplete information? His attempt to clarify this discrepancy fell upon deaf ears. Madara's disdainful scoff seemed to dismiss Abito's concerns as those of a clueless academy student. Uchiha Madara's scowl deepened as he watched Abito struggle. Your talent is abysmal, Abito, he growled. Learning the majestic destroyer flame shouldn't be this difficult. Perhaps I made a mistake saving you. Maybe you were better off dead. Abito bristled under the constant criticism. It's your teaching that's awful, old man, he shot back. If Ikaku Yumino sensei were teaching me, I would have mastered this jutsu by now. Madara's brow furrowed. Ikaku Yumano? Who in the world is that? He's a teacher at the Ninja Academy, Abito explained. Just a chunin, but his teaching skills blow yours out of the water. A chunin? Did you just compare me to a chunin? A freaking chunin? Madara sputtered, his eyebrows twitching in disbelief. He readily admitted many surpassed him in skill, like Senju Hashirama or the legendary Sage of Six Paths. But being compared to a chunin was a new low, it was just unacceptable. Don't try to shift the blame, Abito. This is clearly a talent issue. Back in my day, we learned the same way, and even Hashirama only needed a seal or two for his jutsu. Only those underhanded senju fools relied on elaborate hand signs. Besides, my teaching methods are perfectly standard. I haven't just tossed Uchiha scrolls at you and left you to decipher them on your own. I've provided detailed jutsu scrolls. If you still can't learn, the fault lies entirely with you. Madara was getting fed up with Abito. He summoned White Setsu and instructed him, in a hushed tone. Project a live feed from the Akatsuki training ground, Abito. Watch closely and see how others learn their jutsu. Abito, despite his disdain, complied. He watched the projected scene with a mixture of curiosity about the outside world and a burning desire to find fault with Madara's teaching. He needed to prove it wasn't his own shortcomings, but Madara's inadequate instruction. The scene shifted to Bayakuya who calmly unfurled a scroll containing the adamantine sealing chain's jutsu. He then launched into a detailed explanation of the jutsu's principles, including the intricate chakra manipulation involved. Karen, his student, listened intently, asking clarifying questions whenever she encountered something confusing. Bayakuya patiently addressed each of her inquiries. Once Karen grasped the theoretical foundation of the jutsu, it was time for practical application. Bayakuya meticulously demonstrated the hand signs, explaining each movement and the corresponding chakra flow positions. After several hours of dedicated practice, Karen managed to manifest a single, unstable adamantine ceiling chain. It was slow and flimsy, collapsing within seconds, but it was a start nonetheless. Abito seized on the opportunity. See, old man Madara? That's how a real teacher acts. Look at Bayakuya's gentleness and patience, just like Yumino sensei Madara muttered under his breath, his face clouding with disbelief. This is unbelievable. The last time I saw him teach, Nagato was struggling with some obscure mythological texts. He couldn't stomach the idea of being inferior to a chunin, let alone a young upstart. He scrambled to justify himself. Sensing Madara's wavering confidence, Abito pressed his advantage. That's called adapting your teaching to the student, old man. Different students need different approaches. Nagato's a prodigy, obviously requiring a different method than Karen. That's why Bayakuya shifted his methods according to Karen's level. Madara, forced to confront his shortcomings, conceded with a begrudging nod. Perhaps I was too hasty in my expectations. You're no Nagato, that much is clear. You're unremarkable, a dead last at best. The sting of those words, unremarkable and dead last, ignited a fire in Abito. He may have accepted that label in his past, but hearing it from Madara was unbearable. I'm not a dead last. I just haven't put in the effort. Just you wait, old man Madara, I'll master this jutsu, and you'll see what a useless teacher you truly are. With newfound determination, Abito snatched the jutsu scroll and devoured its content, vowing not to rest until he succeeded. Perhaps Madara, deep down, recognized his own shortcomings as a teacher. He remained silent in the face of Abito's outburst, his gaze fixed on the projection. He observed Bayakuya's meticulous approach with Karen, a flicker of something akin to learning crossing his features. Maybe, just maybe, he could salvage some pride by learning from Bayakuya. After all, Hashirama was his only true defeat. 
Everyone else had fallen before his might. But teaching? That wasn't his forte. Hashirama hadn't been much better. Perhaps, by gleaning some knowledge from Bayakuya, Madara could finally surpass Hashirama in this one area, a small victory after 30 years. Karen's body and mind were exhausted as she approached Bayakuya after casting the adamantine sealing technique again. Disappointment etched itself onto her face as she spoke, her voice heavy with fatigue. Lord Bayakuya, I've poured so much time into this, yet I still haven't mastered the diamond lock. Are you displeased with my aptitude? Bayakuya offered a silent smile, his gaze lingering on Karen. Before commencing their training, he had made it explicitly clear that the adamantine sealing technique was an A-rank jutsu, a level of difficulty reserved for exceptional technique. Even Jonin from the prestigious ninja villages considered mastering one or two A-rank jutsu a significant achievement. Karen, however, had managed to manifest a single chain in a mere morning, a feat that undeniably showcased her talent. Bayakuya's astute estimation placed her mastery of this A-rank jutsu at most half a month away. Her current claims of lacking talent seemed more like an attempt to shirk the demanding training. After all, her potential mirrored her daughter's, much like in the anime. Discerning Karen's ploy with his characteristic stoicism, Bayakuya spoke calmly. The capacity to learn jutsu varies greatly among individuals, Karen. Sealing techniques might not be your forte. Perhaps I have been overly rigorous in my approach. However, your lack of proficiency in sealing techniques necessitates alternative methods for your protection. Therefore, we shall shift our focus to physical training. I will have a 30-kilogram weight prepared for you. Today's warm-up will consist of a 20-kilometer run. Tomorrow, we will commence your specialized physical training regimen. Bayakuya's words struck a chord of discord within Karen. After a moment of internal deliberation, she met his gaze with newfound resolve. Lord Bayakuya, as bearers of the Uzumaki bloodline, I believe we must uphold the traditions of our clan. Mastering Uzumaki sealing techniques are not an option. It's a responsibility I must embrace and carry forward. Is that so? Bayakuya raised an eyebrow with a smile to which Karen offered a determined nod. Though sealing techniques paled compared to the exhilaration of physical training, she recognized the advantage of practicing them at home. This would allow her to circumvent the grueling training regimen Nagato endured daily. Her rudimentary knowledge of medical ninjutsu instilled a sense of confidence. She could manipulate her training to avoid the development of bulky muscles, a transformation she found utterly unappealing. Compared to the harsh realities of the outside world, Karen harbored a deep yearning for the solace of her room. In this haven, she could indulge in her passions. Devouring books, delving into the intricacies of medical ninjutsu, and persisting with the sealing techniques that, while tedious, were ultimately bearable. In short, practicing sealing techniques would guarantee her ideal life of a shut-in. Having dismissed Karen to continue honing the adamantine sealing technique, Bayakuya embarked on his warm-up routine. His mind, however, remained preoccupied with the burgeoning Akatsuki organization. The current climate seemed ripe for Akatsuki's growth. Externally, Kanahigakure and Iwagakure were embroiled in a full-blown ninja war, their attention diverted from any potential infiltration of Amigakure. Internally, Hanzo of the Salamander displayed a blatant disregard for anything beyond the borders of Amigakure, effectively turning a blind eye to Akatsuki's unfettered recruitment efforts. Should this favorable situation persist, Bayakuya envisioned Akatsuki amassing enough power to challenge Amigakure's leadership and overthrow Hanzo within a time frame of three to five years. Such a success would undeniably bolster Bayakuya's reputation, potentially propelling him to the esteemed ranks of Akage of the new Amige Cure. However, this optimistic scenario hinged on a crucial factor. Time. He was still uncertain of many things. Would Hanzo awaken to the burgeoning threat posed by Akatsuki and move to eradicate them before they could fully mature, potentially leading to a devastating clash with mutual destruction on both sides? The possibility of the five great nations launching an impromptu attack on Amige Cure, transforming it back into a war-torn battlefield, was also a concern. These were unsettling unknowns. Just as these anxieties swirled in his mind, an Akatsuki member entered the training ground. The figure bowed respectfully upon seeing Bayakuya. Lord Bayakuya, I have brought intelligence from beyond the land of rain for your perusal. With that, the member presented Bayakuya with a scroll. Bayakuya acknowledged him with a curt nod, signaling his dismissal. He then carefully unfurled the scroll, his eyes intently scanning the intel about the Third Great Ninja War. While the information was limited, its significance was undeniable. The scroll chronicled the pivotal role of Minato Namikaze, leading Kanoha forces, in the destruction of Canopy Bridge. 
This decisive victory effectively thwarted Iwagakure's ambitions for a large-scale invasion of Kanahagakur. Both Iwagakure and Kanahagakur, reeling from significant losses, found themselves ill-equipped to sustain large-scale warfare. The scroll included additional info, rumors of a potential intervention by Kirigakure across the sea, and the brewing possibility of a major conflict erupting between Kumogakure and Kanahagakur. However, these peripheral matters held little bearing on the immediate concerns of Akatsuki. However, the conclusion of the Battle of Kanabi Bridge served as a reminder to Bayakuya. With the focal point of the Great Ninja Village war shifting, the ambitions within the ninja world could very well turn towards the Land of Rain, potentially exposing Akatsuki's existence. Furthermore, the possibility of Abido already having encountered Madara's manipulations loomed large. Bayakuya couldn't shake the chilling thought of Abido potentially operating in the shadows at that very moment. A sudden thought jolted Bayakuya, prompting him to glance sharply into the distance. The timeline aligned perfectly, White Zetsu's surveillance had intensified roughly half a month prior. Could this heightened scrutiny coincide with Abido's encounter with Madara? But there were still some doubts. Why would Madara target him and Nagato without any apparent motive? Bayakuya possessed none of the alluring qualities of the Senju clan. He hadn't mastered wood release, nor did he bear any physical or personality resemblance to Izuna Uchiha. Logically speaking, he shouldn't be a target unless the old man has a thing for creeping on kids. Brushing these unsettling thoughts aside for the moment, Bayakuya summoned Karen and Nagato. He addressed them and relayed the news of the Battle of Canopy Bridge. This served a dual purpose. Partly to motivate them to intensify their training and partly to send a subtle message to Madara and Abito, assuming they were indeed watching. Since Madara's gaze seemed perpetually fixed upon him, Bayakuya recognized the need to maintain a semblance of normalcy in his actions. Madara, eavesdropping on Bayakuya and the others, propped his chin on a hand. A hint of sentimentality tinged his voice as he remarked. The childish games of war finally draw to a close. Kanahegakur truly has fallen from grace. As a ninja who, alongside Hashirama Senju, had ushered in an era of relative peace, Madara held the right to make such a statement. Back in his prime, other ninja villages wouldn't dare provoke Kanahagakur. The combined might of his Susanu and Hashiramas would release Jutsu, the great Buddha, left them with two choices, genuine submission or feigned obedience. Submission, of course, was inevitable. However, a few decades had witnessed a staggering decline in Kanahagakur's power. This was enough to draw Madara's chuckle, bordering on mockery. Abido, engrossed in his ninjutsu training, caught a snippet of Madara's lament. He approached, curiosity etched on his face. What war is coming to an end? The battle over Kanabi Bridge? I had complete faith in Minato-sensei, Kakashi, and Rin. I knew that they will win. Madara cast a dismissive glance at Abito. Had I remained in Kanahagakur, this entire war wouldn't have come to pass. Three minutes. That's all it would have taken to force that brat Anoki to his knees. Who's Anoki? Abito scratched his head in confusion. Madara looked at Abito with confusion. He was fighting a war and he didn't even know the enemy's Kage's name? Seriously, Kanoha Academy, what the hell are you teaching in that hut? The third Tsuchikage, a tenacious little boy. He lacks in true strength, of course. Back in my day, even he and his teacher together couldn't withstand a single exchange with me. Old man Madara, don't you get tired of bragging? Do you honestly believe you could overpower the Tsuchikage? Abito scoffed, crossing his arms and skepticism laced his voice as he challenged Madara's boastful claims. Madara gripped his fist tight. He was really considering paying Kanoha a visit right now. All of his legacy, his prowess and his might, Kanoha had rubbed everything from the history books, it seems. When Abito asked him a direct question, Madara showed a flicker of irritation. He didn't like making empty boasts. It seemed like age hadn't brought any significant upgrades to the Tsuchikage, Anoki. While Anoki had more wrinkles, they wouldn't help against Madara's raw power. Dust release was a formidable technique, but it was useless if it couldn't land a hit. Anoki's reflexes couldn't match Madara's seasoned agility. Abido, sensing a chink in Madara's stoic facade, pressed on. Hey, old man Madara, if you're really as unstoppable as you say, why are you hiding in this dark cave? Why not go back to the village and take back your place as leader? Madara's jaw clenched. He wouldn't admit it to this boy, but the truth was a bitter pill to swallow. The Uchiha clan, blinded by ambition and short-sightedness, had cast him aside. Abido, wise beyond his years, didn't linger on the touchy subject. If you're as powerful as they say, why not just go ahead and do your eye of the moon plan? Dealing with the Hokage shouldn't be a challenge for someone like you, right? Madara's silence lingered, 
heavy with unspoken complexities. Implementing the Eye of the Moon plan wasn't as simple as a walk in the park. It required the capture and sealing of all nine-tailed beasts into the ghetto statue, a feat that would inevitably draw the ire of the five great nations, uniting them against him. His current physical state was a cruel joke. Using Rinnegan would cause a troll to his body, let alone the thought of undertaking the Herculean task of capturing the scattered-tailed beast. Even dealing with the doddering Anoki was a gamble at best, a gamble he couldn't afford to lose until he was back at full strength. Restoring his youthful body required meticulous preparation and a willing sacrifice, a Rinnegan wielder to activate the forbidden samsara of heavenly life technique. A dry cough escaped Madara's lip. Know your place. You, a boy who can barely manage a Birank Jutsu, have no right to question my power. And don't forget the debt you owe me for saving your pathetic life. Abito flinched at the reminder. His Kanahigakur upbringing had instilled a deep respect for his elders, but the weight of a life debt was a heavy burden, tilting the negotiating table decidedly in Madara's favor. He fell silent, caught in a snare of his own making. Abito simmered for a long moment, finally collecting his thoughts. I'll pay back what I owe, but you can't force someone to respect you, so don't expect it from me. You've been following Bayakuya around for so long, haven't you? Maybe you should get the message, you're not exactly a great teacher. I might never even master the Great Fire Annihilation by following your lead. Madara inhaled deeply, a rasp accompanying the action as he dragged the oxygen tube closer to Abito. Slowly, deliberately, he extended a hand. Abito, caught off guard, froze. Should he dodge? Stand still? Fear prickled his skin, and he ended up shivering in place. Without warning, Madara placed his hand on Abito's forehead. His Sharingan blazed, weaving a genjutsu. Those trials were all to test your resolve. Now, the true instruction begins. Within this genjutsu, you'll witness the true power of my teaching methods. Abito's double tomo Sharingan offered no defense. He found himself pulled into the sterile white expanse of the genjutsu space. A youthful Madara stood before him, a faint sigh escaping his lips. Madara spoke with a hint of helplessness. Abito, watch closely. This is how the Great Fire Annihilation is truly performed. With deliberate movements, Madara formed the hand seals, each one a fraction of a second slower than the last. Finally, the powerful words resonated. Fire style. Great Fire Annihilation. A torrent of flames erupted from the young Madara's mouth, engulfing a vast area hundreds of meters wide for a good ten seconds. The display was awe-inspiring. As the flames subsided, Abito stared at Madara with newfound respect. The older man reveled in this shift. That was the extent of my power in my youth. Unfortunately, age has taken its toll. This Jinjutsu allows me to showcase my skills at their peak. Abito's brow furrowed in suspicion. Your youth? Old man Madara, are you trying to pull a fast one on me? This is a Jinjutsu, remember? Could you be exaggerating? Madara scoffed. Lies have no place in my repertoire when it comes to strength. In all the ninja world, only Hashirama Senju surpassed me. All others fell before my might. Confronted with Madara's unwavering conviction, Abito's doubt evaporated. Whoa. Only the Hokage is stronger than you in your prime? Then surpassing you would make me Hokage. Looks like my goals just multiplied. Oh yeah. Madara's gaze sharpened with interest. You, you want to be Hokage? You? Abito bristled, a flicker of annoyance crossing his face. What's that supposed to mean? Do you think I'm not good enough, like everyone else? Madara shook his head slowly. Not at all. I find the notion of being Hokage laughable. Friendships are sacrificed on the altar of that position. Perhaps that's the price one pays for power. A deep sigh escaped his lips, his voice laced with a hint of melancholy as he reminisced about his past. Abito found these words cryptic, but Madara gave him no time to dwell on them. Don't waste time with doubts, boy. If becoming Hokage is your true desire, then follow me and learn properly. Abito, emboldened by the renewed purpose, nodded resolutely. The dream of becoming Hokage burned brighter than ever within him. Exhaustion finally claimed Abito after a day spent trapped within the Jinjutsu's crucible. He emerged, blinking against the harsh cave light, the great fire annihilation now etched into his muscle memory. The Jutsu erupted from his hands with a satisfying roar, mirroring the inferno he'd witnessed in the Jinjutsu world. The transformation in Abito's eyes was a level up. The flippant old man Madara was replaced with a reverent grandpa Madara. The shift tugged at a corner of Madara's weary heart. The genjutsu had drained him. His breaths came ragged, each movement a struggle. All he craved was a deep, uninterrupted sleep. When he finally stirred, Abito was fast asleep, his body spent from the intense training. Madara propped his head on his hand, the events of the day replaying in his mind. 
The arguments, the defiance, the flicker of respect in Abito's eyes. A faint smile played on his lips. It had been years since he'd taken a young Uchiha under his wing, not since his dear brother, Izuna. Perhaps, perhaps training Abito, guiding him towards the Hokage position. The thought sparked a flow of warmth, quickly extinguished by the icy grip of reality. The Hokage? Ridiculous. His purpose, his entire reason for abandoning Konoha, was the eye of the moon plan. When had he softened so much? The ambition that once burned like a supernova had dimmed to a flicker. Hashirama, that doofus. He could only see the immediate concerns like the village and clans. Madara's vision encompassed the entire ninja world, a world forever trapped in a cycle of bloodshed. Only the eye of the moon plan could usher in true peace, a world where petty disputes were consigned to the dustbin of history. A steely glint returned to his eyes. No more escalating clan battles into village wars. It was time to reignite his resolve. He glanced at Zetsu, the twisted figure lurking in the shadows. With a slow, deliberate movement, Madara extended his arm. Sentimentality was a luxury he couldn't afford. Success hinged on an unwavering loyalty to the plan, a will as unyielding as his own. As the black tendrils of Zetsu engulfed Madara's outstretched arm, a new entity emerged, a perfect embodiment of his ambition. Madara gazed at the newly formed black Zetsu, his voice devoid of warmth. You are the will of Madara Uchiha. From this day forward, you shall be known as Black Zetsu. The bond between Madara and Abito had served its purpose. Their paths would diverge, and their interactions would become a mere footnote in the grand scheme of the Eye of the Moon plan. And, I changed Karen's mother's name from Karen to Akane, just when Madara was making his creation, Top 10 Anime Betrayals aka Back Zetsu by Akuya also came out from his meditation. The crimson glow of the setting sun painting the sky in hues of despair sent a silent message. It was time to end the day's training. Bayakuya rose to his full height, his voice cutting through the stillness as he called out to Nagato and Akane, two figures barely discernible in the distance. Enough training for today. Pack up your things. We'll be returning shortly. A sigh of relief, almost audible, rippled through the air as Nagato and Akane acknowledged Bayakuya's command. While they understood and appreciated the merits of rigorous training, Bayakuya's relentless pursuit of perfection could be, well, relentless. After all, even the most dedicated ninja craved a moment's respite from the constant push to excel. As they converged on Bayakuya's position, Nagato, seemingly struck by a sudden thought, turned towards Akane. Did you manage to bring up that topic with Bayakuya? Akane, her expression unreadable, glanced at Nagato before offering a non-committal shrug. The Uzumaki lineage? It's practically a certainty at this point. Think about it. Today, Lord Bayakuya instructed me in yet another one of the Uzumaki clan's secret sealing technique. It's undeniable. He has to be a direct descendant. A thoughtful frown creased Akane's brow. Bayakuya-sama seems disconnected from his Uzumaki heritage. He never mentions the clan as if he's forgotten about it. Sometimes, I envy his raven hair. As long as he stays silent. His Uzumaki lineage remains a secret. Nagato's face mirrored Akane's earlier frown, but it quickly morphed into a mask of stoicism. His own mother, despite being an Uzumaki, had chosen to keep her heritage hidden. Tragically, that secrecy hadn't shielded her from a violent end at the hands of none other than Kanoha ninjas, supposed allies of the Uzumaki clan. A moment of silence stretched between them before Akane spoke again, her voice softer this time. However, Bayakuya-sama also mentioned that the Uzumaki clan is no more. There's no point in clinging to a name that no longer exists. We simply need to make the most of our lives. Nagato pondered Akane's words, a silent battle raging within him. Finally, a small smile tugged at the corners of his lips. Bayakuya is truly an anomaly. Letting go isn't easy for me, but even though the land of whirlpools has been destroyed, this is our home now. Unaware of the conversation revolving around him, Bayakuya observed Nagato and Akane from afar. A knowing smirk played on his lips. He wasn't an Uzumaki, not in the slightest. He felt no emotional ties to a clan that had long faded into oblivion. However, this convenient misunderstanding served his purpose. It painted him as an enigmatic figure, someone who had transcended the shadows of his past, choosing resolute silence over painful memories. Thankfully, their imaginations filled the gaps he so deliberately left open. As Nagato and Akane approached, Bayakuya detailed the upcoming training regimen. Their surprise was evident when they learned that they would only be required to train for 10 days in the following month. In their minds, a month with Bayakuya usually translated to a month of relentless training. Bayakuya, sensing their astonishment, offered a gentle smile. 
don't overthink it. Even the strongest body needs a balance between exertion and rest. Besides, I can't babysit you too constantly. Remember, we are all ninjas, and the day will come when you'll need to go on missions by yourselves. Nagato and Akane exchanged a sheepish glance. They were just about to elaborate when they realized Bayakuya had already turned and begun walking away. Watching his retreating figure, Nagato and Akane couldn't shake the peculiar sensation that Bayakuya, despite being younger than them both, somehow felt like a wise elder guiding their path. This reversal of roles was a curious anomaly, a result of Bayakuya's enigmatic aura. Leaving the training ground behind, Bayakuya bypassed his usual path home and instead set his sights on the Akatsuki's headquarters. It had been nearly two weeks since he last conferred with Yahiko, and the recent conclusion of the Kanabi Bridge battle demanded their immediate attention. Pushing open the familiar door, Bayakuya found Yahiko engrossed in paperwork. A warm smile lit up Yahiko's face as he noticed Bayakuya. Oh, Bayakuya, what a pleasant surprise. What brings you here today? Bayakuya's response was curt, almost bordering on irritation. Leader Yahiko, should I come back later if this is an inopportune time? Yahiko chuckled, raising a hand in appeasement. Of course not, my apologies. It's just unusual for you to visit unless a matter of importance arises. Is it about the recent developments at Canopy Bridge? Bayakuya confirmed Yahiko's suspicion with a curt nod. That's correct. The conclusion of the battle at Canopy Bridge signifies a potential shift in the war's trajectory. I estimate that large-scale hostilities between Kanoha and Iwagakure will soon subside, forcing both sides to redirect their focus elsewhere. Surely that's a positive outcome? Yahiko tilted his head in confusion, failing to grasp Bayakuya's concern. Bayakuya offered a slight shake of his head. While it may be a welcome development for Kanoha and the Land of Grass, it doesn't necessarily bode well for Akatsuki. Yahiko's brow furrowed. Why is that? Bayakuya leaned forward, his voice taking on a more serious tone. Though the large-scale battles between Kanoha and Iwagakure may cease, covert operations by ninja teams will undoubtedly continue. Infiltration tactics are often employed to weaken the enemy from within, like causing chaos in occupied territories, or even resorting to impersonating enemy ninjas to eliminate civilians, Bayakuya elaborated, his words causing Yahiko's expression to harden. Yahiko was no stranger to the grim realities of war. Bayakuya's examples were disturbingly common occurrences, and their potential impact couldn't be ignored. Bayakuya, I appreciate the heads up. I'll ensure our ninjas prioritize civilian protection and actively prevent such incidents. That's the fundamental principle upon which Akatsuki was built. Bayakuya, however, remained unconvinced. He shook his head slowly. Yahiko, I'm afraid you're missing the bigger picture. My primary concern isn't solely civilian safety. It's Akatsuki's precarious position in the midst of these shifting dynamics. Precarious? Yahiko's voice betrayed his confusion. From his perspective, Akatsuki's current standing was relatively secure. With a roster of nearly ten elite ninjas, only a direct intervention from the five great shinobi villages posed a significant threat. He began, his voice trailing off as he considered the additional threat. The five great shinobi villages and possibly, also Hanzo. Yahiko was concerned about the potential danger from the five great shinobi villages, which posed a threat to independent organizations. However, he felt relieved when the leader of the Hidden Rain Village, Hanzo, was mentioned. Lord Hanzo? Why would he target us? The very suggestion seemed ludicrous to Yahiko. In his mind, Hanzo posed no threat. In fact, the opposite seemed more likely. After all, as long as Hanzo remained open to the idea, Akatsuki could always choose to formally join the Hidden Rain Village. Bayakuya, you're letting your worries cloud your judgment. There's no reason for Hanzo to seek our destruction. We pose no threat to him. In fact, we could be valuable allies. If he so chooses, Akatsuki can become an official part of the Hidden Rain Village at any time. Bayakuya met Yahiko's gaze, acknowledging the unwavering determination in his leader's eyes. He wasn't questioning Yahiko's sincerity. In the original timeline, Yahiko readily accepted Hanzo's initial invitation to a meeting, demonstrating his openness to collaboration. Tragically, that meeting had turned into a deadly trap, claiming Yahiko's life. Both Yahiko and Hanzo, in their own ways, had made fatal miscalculations. Hanzo killed Yahiko and Nagato, later as Pain killed Hanzo. A short scoff escaped Bayakuya's lip. Yahiko, I respect your perspective. However, I think Hanzo could be an adversary. If we want Akatsuki to go beyond the limitations of the Hidden Rain Village, we may have to confront this aging demigod. Yahiko remained unconvinced. He shook his head, a smile tugging at the corner of his lips. Bayakuya, you're letting your imagination run wild. 
Akatsuki and Hanzo in conflict? It's simply unfathomable. The five great shinobi villages, yes, they might be wary of us, but Hanzo? No, that's out of the question. Witnessing Yahiko's unshakable belief, a sly smile spread across Bayakuya's face. He had initially intended to nudge Yahiko towards a more cautious approach, but now a more intriguing proposition presented itself. A gamble. Rising from his chair, Bayakuya leaned forward, his eyes locking with Yahiko's. Yahiko, since you're so certain about Hanzo's neutrality, why don't we make a bet? If, within three years, Hanzo takes no action against Akatsuki, I'll wholeheartedly support your vision and follow any order you give. On the other hand, if he does make a move against us, I claim the position of leader. At that point, your leadership will have demonstrably failed Akatsuki. But if you lose, I want you to give up your position as the leader of Akatsuki. At that point, you'll clearly lack the qualifications to lead this organization. Yahiko didn't respond impulsively. He leaned back in his chair, the weight of Bayakuya's proposition falling hard on him. He knew Bayakuya well. The man was a meticulous individual who wouldn't make such a gamble without a solid foundation of belief in its outcome. Hanzo of the Salamander, the war hero of the Amage Cure, the man who, during the last great war, had spearheaded the resistance against the encroachment of the major powers. This time around, it was solely due to Hanzo's presence that the flames of war hadn't engulfed the Amage Cure once more. There was no logical reason for such a revered figure to target Akatsuki, let alone attack them. But a chilling doubt then shook Yahiko's resolve. What if, what if, against all odds, Hanzo did decide to move against Akatsuki? Yahiko couldn't bear to contemplate the potential consequences. One thing was certain. In such a scenario, he wouldn't just be unfit to lead Akatsuki. He would be a detriment to the organization, a liability rather than a leader. After a long, tense silence, Yahiko finally spoke, his voice laced with a newfound determination. Bayakuya, I accept your bet. If Lord Hanzo truly does attack Akatsuki, then the leadership position is rightfully yours. Very well, the bet is established. A satisfied smirk played on Bayakuya's lips as he nodded. The bet itself was merely a means to an end. His true objective wasn't the leadership of Akatsuki. It was the opportunity to give Yahiko a reality check in the event of Hanzo's attack. But regarding the possibility of Hanzo's aggression, well, even if the war hero remained a non-factor for the next three years, Akatsuki itself would inevitably initiate a confrontation with the Amage Cure. The reason was simple, the Amage Cure was a small nation, and its limited territory was insufficient to sustain two thriving ninja organizations. Regardless of the circumstances, a clash between the fledgling Akatsuki and the established Amage Cure was a matter of when, not if. Their ideologies and goals were fundamentally incompatible, making peaceful coexistence an impossibility. Bayakuya knew this as he envisioned the inevitable conflict. The scene shifted after the charged exchange of the bet. Bayakuya, ever the strategist, steered the conversation back to his primary objective. Speaking of which, how's the contribution system faring lately? The bet had been a calculated ploy, a way to test the waters. True to his nature, Bayakuya hadn't strayed from his purpose in seeking out Yahiko. He needed a clear picture of Akatsuki's current state to formulate their next move. Yahiko pursed his lips in thought before replying, the system is currently functioning adequately. While there is a general sense of satisfaction, some people continue to grumble. It's easy to measure the contributions of those who go on the mission, but it's tricky to gauge the value of those who stay behind. Even though no one openly complains, there is an underlying feeling of discontent. Bayakuya leaned back in his chair, steepling his fingers. People used to selflessly contribute without expecting anything in return. But now, with quantifiable measures, even the smallest unfairness becomes very noticeable. This is not about scarcity, but about perceived unfairness. Yahiko's brow furrowed in understanding. So, it's not about having less, but about feeling like some contribute less. Precisely. Previously, the spirit of camaraderie fostered acceptance. Now, with a system emphasizing individual gain, a sense of imbalance can easily arise. Yahiko acknowledged this with a thoughtful nod. Bayakuya, your analysis of the contribution system's woes is spot on. What solutions do you propose? A sly smile played on Bayakuya's lips. There are two options. Do you seek a temporary bandage or a permanent cure? Yahiko felt a tremor of unease snake down his spine at Bayakuya's cryptic words, but curiosity spurred him on. Explain both methods and I'll decide which works best. Bayakuya's eyes gleamed with a predatory light. The most definitive solution is to simply dismantle Akatsuki. Without the organization, the question of allocation becomes moot. 
He paused, letting the weight of his words sink in, before turning his gaze back to Yahiko's now tense form. Seeing the stunned silence he'd elicited, Bayakuya continued, outlining the second method. The alternative is to continuously refine the existing system based on feedback. We can strive to find a solution that resonates with the majority. Yahiko offered a hesitant nod. The second one sounds like a viable method. Bayakuya, however, extinguished that spark with a casual shrug. I figured you'd lean towards refining the system. But the harsh reality is, option one might be more likely. Our financial situation is projected to take a nosedive soon. When that happens, distribution issues become a moot point. There simply won't be anything left to distribute. Yahiko blinked his expression, a mix of confusion and disbelief. Another financial crisis? But the financial reports I've seen indicate a healthy surplus. The cheerful outlook by Akuya had offered just moments ago seemed a cruel illusion now. Here they were, supposedly on the upswing, and yet another financial crisis would be coming for their neck. Bayakuya cleared his throat, gesturing towards his glass. Yahiko reacted swiftly, refilling his drink. After taking a sip and composing himself, Bayakuya continued. Recall that earlier point I made about an impending crisis? It's multifaceted, Yahiko. It's not just about our ninja force, but our financial well-being as well. Think about it. With Kanahagakur and Iwagakur avoiding large-scale conflicts lately, who exactly is buying Conan's explosive tags? He leaned forward and raised his finger. And let's not forget, the inflated prices we're currently charging for those tags barely keep us afloat. Once the market forces those prices back down to normal, Akatsuki will face a critical decision. We will either have to stop recruiting or cut back on winning hearts and mind. Don't delude yourself, Yahiko. These days of relative comfort are temporary. We're destined for another period of hardship. Yahiko slumped back in his chair, a heavy silence descending upon them. Bayakuya's words, harsh as they were, painted an undeniable picture of Akatsuki's precarious situation. Akatsuki's financial situation was a precarious tightrope walk, with only two meager sources of income. Missions, which were sporadic bursts of revenue, and Conan's explosive tags. Mission income was practically negligible compared to the steady stream generated by tag sales. A drop in those inflated tag prices wouldn't be a gentle nudge. It would be a plummeting freefall into a financial crisis, the only seemingly viable solution, restarting the very wars they sought to abolish, went against their core principles. But halting recruitment meant stagnation, hindering their ability to expand and spread their message of peace. It was a vicious cycle with no apparent escape hatch. Bayakuya monitored Yahiko's deepening worry with a flutter of concealed satisfaction. The world of Shinobi might glorify raw power, but for those lacking a Mangekyo Sharingan or Six Paths prowess, it still operated under a similar set of rules as the world he came from. Wars, initially decided by cunning strategies and meticulous tactics, inevitably devolved into tests of endurance. The victor wasn't solely determined by the strength of its shinobi, but also by the financial backing of the nation behind them. This explained why Kanahigakur, despite minimal gains from the great ninja wars, always bounced back swiftly. The Land of Fire, Kanoha's supporting pillar, was a powerhouse of wealth. Smaller villages outside the Big Five presented a stark contrast. Take the Land of Rain, for example. Even with a formidable leader like Hanzo, their lack of resources meant any temporary success was unsustainable. They'd inevitably regress, forced into isolationist policies. The reason Akatsuki, during Yahiko's era, hadn't encountered this dilemma was due to their small size. Once they expanded to the scale of a ninja village, even a smaller one with just a few hundred members, financial considerations became paramount. Otherwise, why else would Nagato and Conan, in later years, resort to taking bounty missions to fund their war preparations? By that point, Yahiko's ideals had long been corrupted. After a thoughtful silence that stretched taut between them, Yahiko met Bayakuya's gaze. The strategist, anticipating this moment, held up two fingers, outlining a path forward. Two methods exist. The first is to manipulate events from the shadows, to sow discord and ignite conflict. I'm certain you wouldn't entertain such a notion. A resolute glint flashed in Yahiko's eyes. Of course not. It is just against the very basis of my vision. Bayakuya continued, a hint of a plan forming in his eyes. The second option is to utilize our current funds to invest in lucrative industries. We could develop groundbreaking new products and leverage these ventures to sustain the organization's future operations. We wouldn't be reliant on the sale of explosive tags for survival anymore. I suspect you'll find this option more suitable. Yahiko's head dipped in a hesitant nod. Bayakuya's understanding of him had grown considerably of late. 
He knew inciting wars from the shadows wasn't an option Yahiko would entertain. So, the strategist had proposed an alternative, acquiring industries to address Akatsuki's looming financial crisis. However, some doubts danced in Yahiko's eyes as he caught Bayakuya's playfully glinting gaze. The suggestion felt off somehow. After careful deliberation, Yahiko concluded that Bayakuya's words were ultimately empty. Profitable industries naturally generated income. Existing, established ones wouldn't require forceful acquisition by another organization that would fall back into the very cycle they aimed to break. Bayakuya, with a shrewd grin, seemed to anticipate Yahiko's line of thinking. Don't worry, boss. Forceful acquisition isn't on the table. I have a few well-considered methods in mind. Bayakuya wasn't merely placating Yahiko. He genuinely possessed a repertoire of unconventional money-making strategies. One such plan involved civilianizing existing ninja technology, a prospect brimming with lucrative possibilities. The disparity between military and civilian technology in the ninja world was vast. While Kanahigakure's labs toiled away on wood-release Kekiai Genkai cloning, rural farmers were reduced to cultivating land through sheer muscle power. Even during crucial planting and harvest seasons, the reliance on ninjas remained a stopgap measure. Perhaps this was a way for lower-level ninja to secure missions and income. Or, more likely, it was a deliberate strategy by nobles to restrict the ninja's influence. Confining ninjas to the mercenary sector, barring them entry into other industries, indirectly maintained the dominance of the daimyos and nobility. But by Akuya, he saw no need to play by those established rules. Yahiko leaned back in his chair, a flicker of trust crossing his features. I'll leave this matter in your capable hands, Bayakuya. While the intricacies of Bayakuya's plan remained shrouded in mystery, Yahiko had an unshakable faith in the strategist's resourcefulness. After all, Bayakuya had masterfully navigated Akatsuki through a financial crisis before, and Yahiko held no doubts about his ability to repeat the feat suddenly. A sharp glint entered Bayakuya's eyes as he fixed Yahiko with a piercing gaze. Before we delve further, Yahiko, I have a question that demands your honest response. Imagine our ventures flourish attracting the covetous eyes of other ninjas and nobles. How would you react? Would you endure in silence, relinquishing your hard-earned success, or would you stand your ground and retaliate? Yahiko's brow furrowed in contemplation. Bayakuya's question transcended mere industries. It resonated with the very core of Akatsuki's existence. He understood the veiled threat. Akatsuki itself would eventually become a target for those seeking power and wealth. After a thoughtful pause, Yahiko spoke with unwavering resolve. Retaliate, he declared firmly. Should we be forced into such a corner, we won't hesitate to defend ourselves. Standing idly by is not an option. Bayakuya offered a curt nod, a hint of satisfaction gleaming in his eyes. Indeed, it seems we share a certain commonality on this matter. Though he acknowledged the point of agreement, Bayakuya quickly dismissed the notion of genuine camaraderie. Observing Yahiko's relentless pursuit of his ideals, Bayakuya had witnessed a gradual erosion of the leader's naivety. The truth was far more sinister. Akatsuki's growth was on a collision course with Amigekure. Conflicts of interest were inevitable, and an explosive confrontation loomed on the horizon. Bayakuya's plan, however, harbored a far grander ambition. Akatsuki's ultimate ascendancy as the dominant power in the Land of Rain, replacing Amigekure's rule entirely. For now, they were in the phase of accumulating strength, biding their time. When the moment arrived, Bayakuya would orchestrate the takeover, regardless of Amigekure's stance. By that point, Yahiko's idealistic vision would be rendered irrelevant. Yahiko remained blissfully unaware of the churning thoughts within Bayakuya. He felt a little insecured. Here he was, the leader of Akatsuki, yet he felt utterly incompetent in Bayakuya's presence. Confined to the office, Yahiko spent his days buried under a mountain of paperwork, unable to tackle the organization's larger issues. Bayakuya, however, held a different perspective. While Yahiko's unwavering idealism bordered on naivety, he possessed undeniable strength. His compassionate nature and patient demeanor fostered a sense of camaraderie within Akatsuki's rank. Unlike Bayakuya himself, Yahiko possessed the time and temperament to handle the tedious minutiae, assigning tasks and offering solace to the villagers they sought to protect. Bayakuya harbored no illusions about delegating leadership. Konan perhaps, but her potential wouldn't blossom for a few years yet. Nagato, with his meek personality, was entirely out of the question. The rest lacked the necessary skills and experience. After all, most ninjas were glorified mercenaries, devoid of formal education. While Yahiko, Nagato, and Conan weren't ideal choices, their tutelage under the legendary Jiraiya set them apart from the others. 
More importantly, placing them at the helm made them convenient targets, a liability in Bayakuya's scheme of covert wealth accumulation. After a half-hour conversation, Bayakuya rose to leave Akatsuki's headquarters. As he departed, Yahiko surprised him with a new task, a joint mission with Conan the following day. They were to sell explosive tags and scout for potential investment opportunities. Bayakuya, to his amusement, didn't decline. It had been a while since he'd ventured out, and the thought of remaining perpetually confined to the base was unappealing. He wouldn't become another Kagaya Atsutsuki, a being with formidable power on paper, but lacking the practical experience to translate it into victory. The next morning, after warming up, Bayakuya arrived at Conan's doorstep. After a few impatient rings, the door creaked open, revealing a bleary-eyed Conan. Bayakuya? She mumbled, her voice thick with sleep. What brings you by so early? Bayakuya's eyes narrowed as he noticed the dark circles marring Conan's youthful face. Late nights again, Conan-senpai? Didn't we discuss the law of supply and demand? Your health isn't something to gamble with. Not exactly late night. I pulled an all-nighter, that's all. Conan mumbled a protest. Blinking rapidly, she added. I've also cut back on explosive tag production recently. We have a surplus now, so I've implemented a system where everyone can exchange tags at the warehouse. It'll ensure everyone has enough for missions and stays safe. By Akuya's side, overtime was practically ingrained in Akatsuki's culture. Back then, they hadn't even received salaries, relying solely on unwavering dedication. Conan's distribution system essentially meant everyone was working for free, albeit indirectly promoting the organization's growth. But at what cost? He couldn't shake off the worry that Conan might push herself to the breaking point. Just then, Conan seemed to remember the reason for his visit. By Akuya, did Yahiko assign us another mission together? Is that why you're here? Similar to last time. Except this time, we have an additional task, scouting investment opportunities. Would you mind showing me the map of the land of Rain's towns? Conan retrieved the map from her room and handed it to him. As Bayakuya unfolded it, his gaze fell upon a marked location, the black market. A frown creased his brow. Is this map outdated? Wasn't the black market destroyed? Why is there another one in the same spot? Conan shrugged with helplessness in her eyes. It seems they've rebuilt the black market in the same location. Bayakuya felt a surge of frustration. He knew the black market's existence likely stemmed from corrupt local nobles, but for it to rise from the ashes just two months later, in the exact same location, that was concerning. However, considering the land of rain size, suitable alternatives were probably scarce. Having marked everything on the map, Bayakuya returned it to Conan. Together, they stepped out of the Akatsuki base, ready for their joint mission. Arriving at the black market in the land of rain, Conan and Bayakuya couldn't help but be surprised by the unusually smooth journey. They had expected to encounter some trouble, perhaps rogue ninjas or bandits, but instead, they witnessed an unexpected sense of public security in the area. Bayakuya, in particular, had anticipated the opportunity for combat practice or to seek out potential members for their organization among the supposed threats along the way. However, to their surprise, the journey was devoid of any such encounters. Not even a single bandit or rogue ninja crossed their path. Reflecting on this unexpected turn of events, Bayakuya considered the recent influence of the Akatsuki in the Land of Rain and how their efforts to take over and protect the villages had possibly contributed to the surprisingly peaceful state of the region. He mused over the rarity of encountering skilled rogue ninjas, realizing that those who would choose to wander freely were likely individuals who had somehow offended the village's authorities. After arriving at a familiar town, Conan turned to Bayakuya before asking, The black market is just ahead. Are we working together this time, or completing our tasks separately? Bayakuya glanced at Conan and replied, Let's split up. I'm having a gut feeling this place isn't safe enough. Conan nodded, showing a look of understanding as expected. After their previous mission together, she knew that Bayakuya didn't like dealing with too many people and preferred operating in the shadows. This preference was different from that of most other members of their organization. After confirming that they would act separately, Bayakuya didn't leave immediately. Instead, he followed Conan, deploying his paper clones to gather intelligence related to her. Once Conan entered the black market, she attracted the attention of many people, including black market merchants, rogue ninjas, and the hidden figures behind the Land of Rain's black market. Bayakuya could sense these gazes thanks to the Mind's Eye of the Kagura ability he had obtained from Nagato. The Mind's Eye of the Kagura is an exceptionally powerful sensory ninjutsu, capable of discerning others' intentions and moral alignment. In this respect, its abilities can be even more terrifying than the Byakugan and Sharingan. Bayakuya continued to follow Conan. 
After turning into an alley in the black market, Conan found a black market merchant. Upon seeing Conan, the merchant immediately put on a fawning smile and approached her. Conan had been a regular customer in recent months, each time bringing a large number of explosive tags to sell, allowing the merchant to earn a significant profit as an intermediary. Conan was not deceived by the merchant's ingratiating smile. She took out a scroll containing the explosive tags and began negotiating the price. One side argued that the demand for explosive tags had decreased due to the recent lull in warfare, and thus, the price would drop. The other side insisted that the production of explosive tags was limited, and if the price did not meet expectations, she would rather not sell them. Bayakuya had little interest in the bargaining process. He was more concerned with finding out who controlled this black market. As Bayakuya looked around, he noticed the bodyguard surrounding the merchant, which caught his attention. These individuals had chakra levels far higher than those of ordinary people, reaching Chunin levels. The merchant negotiating with Conan was even more exceptional, possessing Jonin level chakra. However, the merchant seemed to be dealing with some health issues and appeared very weak. After some negotiation, Conan left the alley with a box of money. Bayakuya chose not to follow her, but instead, he hid in a corner to observe the black market merchant. In addition to helping Conan sell the explosive tags, Bayakuya was also looking for potential business partners. Collaborating with an existing merchant would be much simpler than starting from scratch. This black market merchant seemed to be a promising candidate. As Conan finished her business at the black market and started to make her way out, a group of sly ninjas approached the merchant and menacingly gestured across their throats with their fingers. Lord Shigure, the blue-haired Kunoichi has returned to peddle her explosive tags. Shall we apprehend her? I've heard rumors that she's affiliated with the notorious Akatsuki. They've been quietly expanding their influence, but their leader has never bowed down to Lord Hanzo. Perhaps it's time to bring her before Lord Hanzo. After listening to his subordinate's report, the black market merchant named Shigure shook his head. The most important thing in the black market is the rules. We cannot break them. Besides, do you think a ninja daring enough to sell explosive tags would be an ordinary person? She must have the backing of one of the five great shinobi villages. We just need to earn a bit of profit. There's no need to offend one of the great villages. I will report this information to Lord Hanzo and let him decide. Yes, Lord Shigure. The rain ninjas responded respectfully. You can all leave now. Don't disturb my rest. Waving his hand to dismiss his subordinates, Shigure turned around, revealing a sullen expression. He seemed quite impatient with his underlings. Bayakuya overheard the conversation between the rain ninjas and noticed Shigure's dark expression. Shigure, the black market merchant, was actually a jonin from Amige Cure. This revelation didn't surprise Bayakuya as he suspected that the black market within the land of rain was connected to the nation's upper echelons. What surprised him was that the black market was directly controlled by Amige Cure and its merchants were ninjas. This revelation was concerning because it meant that Conan's activities, such as selling explosive tags and procuring supplies, had always been under Amige Cure's watchful eye. The thought that Hanzo might have been monitoring the Akatsuki all along wasn't comforting. The fact that Hanzo hadn't taken action against the Akatsuki yet might simply be because the organization was too weak, and Yahiko's ideals were too pacifist. An organization that consistently sought peaceful resolutions through dialogue appeared to pose no real threat. The Akatsuki's presence held the potential to bolster security outside Amige Cure's borders, and Hanzo may have welcomed the prospect of the Akatsuki's growth, possibly even entertaining thoughts of a future alliance with Amige Cure. However, these possibilities were contingent on the absence of external interference. It was improbable for the Land of Rain, the infamous battleground of the Third Shinobi World War, to remain undisturbed. The destabilization of the Land of Rain played to the advantage of the three major nations bordering it. Thus, while the Akatsuki projected an image of non-aggression, they could not afford to be entirely powerless. After meticulously noting down Shigure's name and chakra pattern, Bayakuya silently departed from the black market, making his way to the designated rendezvous point with Conan. Upon seeing Bayakuya, Conan curiously asked, Bayakuya, how's your investment plan going? Bayakuya decided to tease Conan a bit as he smirked. I've got some leads on the investment plan, but first, can you guess the identity of the black market merchant you were dealing with? You followed me? But what does the merchant's identity have to do with us? Conan retorted. Bayakuya explained with a hint of exasperation. The black market merchant's name is Shigure, and he's a jonin from Amige Cure. This means your activities of selling explosive tags and procuring supplies have been under Hanzo of the Salamander's watch. Isn't that obvious? Our activities couldn't possibly escape Hanzo's notice. Conan replied nonchalantly. 
Conan was not surprised. Within the Akatsuki, almost everyone believed that Hanzo of the Salamander wouldn't be a threat to their organization. If Bayakuya only knew of Hanzo's reputation and not the future plot, he would have thought the same. Unfortunately, Hanzo, the once great hero, ultimately became a villain, killing the new hero and giving rise to an even more terrifying demon. Confronted with Conan's steadfast belief, Bayakuya chose to present an alternative perspective. Hanzo may not directly oppose the organization, but who's to say there aren't individuals influencing him from behind the scenes? What if they convince him to turn against us? Conan nodded in agreement, her expression turning serious as she looked at Bayakuya. You're right, Bayakuya. We must prevent that from happening. What do you plan to do and do you need my help? Should I start procuring supplies from a different place? Conan's sudden change in attitude caught Bayakuya off guard, but he quickly responded. The organization is already exposed to Hanzo. It's too late to stay hidden. Continue as you have been. Leave the rest to Yahiko and me. Hearing this, Conan nodded slightly. I trust you, Bayakuya. Conan's trust warmed Bayakuya's heart, but as he calmed down, he realized something was off. Did Conan think he might be the one sowing discord within the Akatsuki? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.